Good morning, everyone, and welcome all by Aosta Valley region and the SAB to the second day of Digital Alpine Convention with the aim to continue to explore the potential of digitalization for the Alpine area. Thomas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carlo, for uh Re-hosting us today, this is the first point because uh, Valle d'Aosta has technically organized all this conference and at this point I would really like to thank you and all your colleagues for the work that you have done. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to guide you, uh, dear participants, once again through this second day. Maybe some of you have not been here yesterday, so we are really discussing this day, these two days, as Carlo already said, about the potentials of digitalization for the Alpine area. We had uh, very inspiring discussions already yesterday. We had two very inspiring uh, keynote speeches, one from Germany, one from Italy, which will also lead our future activities, I think. And we had four different workshops on very interesting topics. And most of all, we had uh, conclusions from young people in the Alpine area who really told us also their vision. And these are points that we will pick up today, also during the discussion. For today, for the program of today, we will have uh, first three political keynote speeches, which really show us the European background. And then we will, uh, after a short break, go into a discussion because today uh, the main goal is really to try to build network, to create synergies with other initiatives. Because we know that we as the macro regional strategy for the Alpine area, USALP or us as Action Group 5, we are not alone in the Alpine area. There are a lot of initiatives, activities already going on and we would like to create synergies with those. And for this, we have uh, identified several speakers, which will be surely very interesting to discuss with. And uh, one of the highlights also today is uh, one of our major activities. We have uh, been working on smart villages and we will launch uh, today the network of uh, Alpine smart villages and smart regions. Uh, this is the program for today. So uh, I know it, it's once again uh, three hours of uh, sitting in front of the screen. It can be tiring. We hope it is uh, nevertheless inspiring for you that you can stay with us for the whole time. We try to keep it as dynamic as possible. And please, participants, you find on your on the website where you are, you, you are registered now, also a chat function. So if you have questions to the speakers, please don't hesitate. Write down those questions to the speakers, if possible, uh, please in English, and please address them directly to individual speakers so that I can pick them up and I will uh, use them then in the discussion most of all then for the uh, plenary discussion where I hope that we can co-build this discussion and not that I have to moderate everything alone. So, uh, for a little bit of history, <laughs> one year ago we started with planning of this uh, conference and uh, when we were still one year younger, less grey hair than today, we thought, okay, this will be a physical conference that we can held in Trieste. And we had already organized everything for Trieste. It would be marvelous to be in Trieste this year. But unfortunately, you know the reasons we cannot be. We hope that next year we can be in Trieste. But uh, as we have foreseen to have a high level uh, introduction also from Trieste, uh, we would like to bring it forward to you. We have uh, invited Sebastian Callari. He's uh, one of, uh, let's say, the major players, political players in Italy for everything that's uh, linked to digitalization. He is uh, active on the national level as a deputy president for technolo technological innovation and digital policy. And he's also assessore for IT systems of the province of Friuli, Venezia Giulia. And he will now give us a brief um, welcome. And for this, we have a video that he has prepared that we can now look together. È con grande piacere che rivolgo il mio saluto ai partecipanti di questa prima edizione della Digital Arts Conference. A cominciare dal delegato alla presidenza del turno francese, agli alti funzionari della Commissione europea e a tutti i rappresentanti delle 48 regioni della strategia macro-regionale EUSALPS. Il compito della politica è quello di costruire un futuro migliore per tutti i cittadini, senza lasciare nessuno indietro 
e valorizzando le potenzialità e le eccellenze di ciascun territorio. E questo vale anche quando si parla di innovazione tecnologica e di, di digitalizzazione. Le reti telematiche capaci di portare la banda ultralarga nelle aree rurali e montane e le piattaforme che attraverso le reti erogano, erogano i servizi ai cittadini e alle imprese sono le prime infrastrutture abilitanti che necessitano di garantire una sostanziale uguaglianza nelle opportunità dei territori. Tutto questo però non è sufficiente. È necessario che le opportunità vengano colte, e attivate, adattate, oltre che al progresso di tipo tecnologico, che, eh, che sia rivolta anche altrettanta attenzione anche al fattore umano, attraverso la diffusione di competenze digitali e alla valorizzazione di tutte quelle attività che tradizionalmente sono legate ai territori della regione alpina e che sono caratterizzati da una forte identità culturale. Per anni infatti abbiamo parlato di telelavoro e di scuola e sanità digitale, ma solo con l'emergenza pandemica abbiamo, siamo stati costretti a confrontarci con questi concetti, riconvertendo in pratica in chiave smart tutti i processi che quotidianamente costituiscono il fulcro del nostro essere cittadini. E questo ha messo in luce ovviamente tutte le difficoltà e il diverso livello di preparazione che ciascun territorio aveva nell'affrontare la sfida della digitalizzazione. Ora, studiare, lavorare, fare impresa, consultare un medico sono attività che quando sono disponibili infrastrutture telematiche risultano facili, sicure, affidabili e prescindono dalla collocazione geografica eh, e possono essere svolte agevolmente in tutti i villaggi anche più, più lontani, più periferici, eh, grazie proprio al raccordo telematico che si può avere con le aree urbane di riferimento. Quindi è necessario confrontarci e collaborare per trovare delle soluzioni innovative in relazione alle quali l'interoperabilità dei dati, la cyber security, quale garanzia di diritto alla privacy e l'inclusione di chi oggi non riesce o non vuole utilizzare le nuove tecnologie costituiscono i pilastri di un nuovo diritto alla cittadinanza digitale. Oltre che alla interoperabilità dei dati, però è necessario lavorare anche all'interoperabilità delle soluzioni ed è proprio in questi termini che la strategia macro-regionale EUSALP può dare il maggior contributo, contribuendo a costruire, grazie al supporto delle istituzioni comunitarie, un percorso capace di correggere le disuguaglianze fra le diverse aree e capitalizzare la progettualità che ciascuno con le proprie specificità costituiscono delle best practices replicabili in quel complesso sistema di territori che è la regione alpina. Le strategie per la digitalizzazione elaborate nei diversi paesi la valorizzazione delle applicazioni che hanno avuto un maggior impatto e la recentissima Digital Compass per il 2030 sono quindi gli elementi da cui partire per costruire una nuova policy comune in materia di digitalizzazione e innovazione tecnologica. Innovazione che deve essere capace di individuare le criticità e indirizzare opportunamente le risorse anche di derivazione comunitaria per garantire le migliori opportunità di lavoro e crescita agli altri, agli altri 80 milioni di cittadini che vivono nella regione alpina. Nello spiegare quindi che i risultati delle diverse sessioni tecniche possono essere di stimolo per individuare con i decisori politici un percorso efficace, concreto e condiviso, auguro a tutti un buon lavoro, con la speranza di rivederci fra un anno, magari qui a Trieste e in presenza per la seconda edizione della Digital Alps Conference. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Callery, even if he's not uh, physically present today. Uh, I think this uh, was a very inspiring presentation also, really to recall us the importance of digitalization and all. I think that all that our work that we are carrying out now in this macro region strategy for the Alpine era really reflects very well also what uh, Mr. Callery was saying before. And of course, we, we really hope that next year we can be uh, in Trieste because uh, today we have the first Digital Labs conference and from now on we really would like to do this every year so next year we hope to be in Trieste, <coughs> Trieste and really that this pandemia is over by that time. So uh, now uh, as I said we are here for the macro region strategy for the Alpine area we're discussing about Alpine areas but of course every macro region strategy is also embedded in a European context and of course the European Union is also doing a lot and therefore I'm very happy to have two representatives from the European Commission today on board with me this is uh, first Gerard de Graaf from DG Connect and second also Silvia Michelini from DG Agri. I will uh, present them now and I will first invite Gerard de Graaf to join me here on the panel. 
Yeah. Hello, Mr. De Graaf. Good morning to you. <laughs> good, good morning. Thanks for joining us. I see that you are still working at home. That's perfect. Yeah. So uh, digitalization really eases a lot our work. Uh, we are all connected through Auster Valley with the technology. You are seated, I think, in uh, the Netherlands, if I'm right. I'm talking to you from Switzerland. So this is perfect. This allows us a lot of flexibility and new models of living and working. So uh, now we, you are the director for digital transformation. We already heard a lot about digital transformation yesterday from Andrea Gumi and Stefan Hess. And now it would be really the opportunity to give the floor to you to see also the vision of uh, DigiConnect on this topic. Thank you very much, Mr. De Graaf. Very good. Us. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Egger. Um, welcome to all the participants. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm actually joining you from Brussels, uh, near the uh, European Commission headquarters. And as you can see, we are still working from home. Um, I was born uh, at nine meters below sea level in one of the Dutch polders. And as you know, um, there are no mountains in the Netherlands. We have a few hills. Uh, for me, when I grew up, so the highest point in the landscape were the dikes, which kept us safe. And so we call those the Dutch mountains. But I think the fact that, uh, at least in my case, I grew up uh, in, in a country that is as flat as a pancake uh, has given me a lot of fascination for the Alps. And, um, and I, I, I think it's beauty, uh, it's culture, it's traditions, uh, it's people. Um, and it's a, it's a very, the Alps are part of Europe. Uh, I, I mean, and part of Europe, not just geographically. I think we all have a bit of Alps inside of us, uh, and, and, and therefore it, it is so important that that region uh, continues to thrive. Uh, and, and we've all seen, and you've lived it uh, over the last uh, decades, say the impacts of socioeconomic changes um, on the Alpine region, uh, globalization, urbanization, demographic change, demographic decline, aging, have affected the Alpine region uh, with particular force, uh, uh, depopulation, eroding infrastructure, particularly social infrastructure, uh, have affected rural areas, service provision, the quality of service provision, employment opportunities, uh, drop of incomes in, in rural areas, uh, and, and also, uh, and we'll be talking about that, of course, the, the, the limited transport and, and digital connectivity networks. And so I think the key message here is that uh, often when I speak about technology and digital, it, it is seen as a threat because it comes in, it, <clears throat> it is disruptive, it changes a lot. I think particularly, I mean, of course, I, I always say that there's huge opportunities here, but I, I, I particularly in the context of the Alpine regions, I think digital is an incredibly, op incredible opportunity for the Alpine regions to not just reverse these negative trends, but to breathe new life into the Alpine regions, to attract young people, to retain young people, to um, enable a new uh, activity, economic activity, innovation. And that is because digitalization actually removes the friction of distance. Uh, we are gradually moving to a distance society and therefore all the assets of the digital region can be combined with the like the attractions of like life uh, across Europe, all the opportunities you have uh, through teleworking, through kind of starting up a, a business in the Alpine regions by kind of developing new business models and, and, and that can fit in very well. Uh, the modern aspect, the modernization of digitalization with the traditions, the festivals and the cultures of the Alpine region. So I think that vision, which I, I know you are like uh, reflecting, you're, you're conveying, I think is a very, very powerful vision. And, and, and the Digital Alps is, is really a, a great promise that, 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 that together in partnership can be delivered and the European Union will also play its full role. Well, I, I don't need, I think, to go into a great level of detail why digital is important, but it does present a lot of these opportunities for rural enterprises, as I've just said, uh, better public services, individualized healthcare, distance learning, 
um, remote working arrangements. I mean, people can live in the Alps, enjoy the beauty, the nature, the culture, and, and at the same time uh, provide services and or, or be employed by companies that are located elsewhere. We see, I mean, we're working from home. It is perfectly possible. There is absolutely no reason to go back to the pre-COVID times in terms of the organization of, of work. So that, I think, can create huge attraction and, and make the Alpine region a magnet for development and for uh, attracting uh, uh, young people uh, to, to, to the region. What does it take? I, I think there's a number of things and, and what you are doing I think is, is truly uh, important and, 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 and absolutely right. It, it does require awareness raising. Uh, digital is complicated, technology is complicated and you can in a way, scare people with it. I mean, there's all these new technologies that are coming, what's happening, can I still follow? I think it's very important that kind of people are informed about what technology can do and how it can help improve the quality of their lives. This is not about the technology. It's like a car. You don't need to know what's under the hood, how the engine works. It's where it can take you. It's the opportunities that a car creates. And, and, and therefore, I think very much the communication also from the kind of the applications, what, 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 what can technology deliver that, that is now much more difficult to deliver, like good public services, new opportunities for innovation. Then you need capacity building. Uh, and capacity building includes also skills. Uh, it includes uh, infrastructure. Uh, if you don't have the connectivity, it's going to be impossible uh, to have a successful transformation strategy. So there is work to be done with capacity building. Also here, I mean, the uh, public uh, sector can help, the EU can help. I mean, we are, for example, uh, working very hard with the member states to put in place in every region in Europe, including in the Alpine region, digital innovation hubs where kind of small businesses can go, craftsmen can go and say, I need some help. Uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of, uh, I have some ideas, but, but I don't yet know how technology can help me to deliver on those ideas. So we need to do capacity building. Uh, we need to promote skills, uh, digital skills, basic digital skills, but also advanced digital skills uh, so that the potential of technology is fully exploited. If people think it's too complicated, they don't know how to use it, or, or the infrastructure isn't um, conducive, is, isn't available in, in the local community, it is not going to happen. Uh, the promise remains a promise, it's not delivered in, in practice. In, in my directorate in the Commission in, in, in DG Connect, uh, we uh, uh, track uh, quite carefully how uh, digital is uh, developing across the European Union and we, we see um, signals of a digital divide and when we look at the digital divide we often look at it in terms of like social digital divide. I mean people coming from low income backgrounds uh, not having uh, the same opportunities as people who are kind of from uh, more kind of uh, I mean more positive like economic backgrounds but what we also see in the European Union and we issue every year what we call a digital economy and society index is a geographic divide and, and that is uh, of course uh, worrying and that's what we have to avoid and and just looking at a number of um, what I mentioned uh, kind of really critical um, uh, components critical factors um, like uh, connectivity or skills. I mean, if we look at skills, for example, and we look at rural areas uh, as opposed to as, as compared to uh, more densely populated areas, we see that in the more densely populated areas, two out of three Europeans have at least basic digital skills. If you look at scarcely populated areas, including the Alpine regions, it goes down to one in two. If you look at Broadband connectivity, nine out of 10 of overall of the European population have fast broadband access. If you go to rural areas, including the Alpine regions, it is six out of 10. 
for very high capacity networks, which is what we will need in the future for all these applications like personalized healthcare, the figure stands at one in two in scarcely populated areas. So only one, uh, the, the figure stands at one in four in scarcely populated areas, whereas it is six in 10 in the more densely populated areas. So this is quite dramatic because if you don't have these preconditions in place, uh, the risk is that the, the divide will only grow. Uh, and, and that, of course, denies people uh, access to uh, absolutely like basic necessities like healthcare and education. So we need a joint effort. And I think what you're doing together in partnership uh, at the grassroots level is absolutely crucial. Uh, we need a joint effort at the European level. Uh, we need to kind of uh, uh, good policies. Uh, we need good ambitions and visions. At the EU level, we have a strategy which was adopted in March, which sets out some targets where we need to be no later than by 2030. Uh, we need to have all Europeans connected to 5G by 2030 and sooner if possible. We need fully accessible public services for everyone, including people with disabilities by no later than 2030. And we need a population that has the competences to make the most of a digital future. At least 80% of the adult population should have basic digital skills, 60% now. We need also a sufficient number of digital experts uh, in, in order to kind of produce the technology in Europe. Well, all of this, I mean, costs money and, and a lot of money. Uh, we need to see massive investments in Europe and in the Alpine regions to achieve these ambitions. We have programs to, to achieve this. Uh, we have, of course, and, and my colleague uh, Silvia Michelini, uh, who will speak next, will, will, will take us through kind of the, the programs that exist, uh, how Europe uh, can, can, can also mobilize, uh, for example, the agricultural fund, we have structural funds, we have, you know, of course, the social fund with training programs, we have also the, the research uh, program, the Digital Europe program, the Connecting Europe facility, so there is uh, funding available that now needs to be directed to these objectives. We also have, as you know, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which is Europe's answer to build a better future after COVID, a greener Europe, a more digital Europe. More than 670 billion euro is available for infrastructure, for reforms, for the creation of jobs. There's a legal requirement that at least 20% of this 670 billion euros needs to be invested in digital applications, particularly in rural areas, you know, such as connectivity networks, which would enable your municipalities, your villages to digitalize, build local data platforms and help to upskill the labor force and, and the population. 20% means at least 134 billion euros will become available in the next few years for those type of investments. And we have been looking at national recovery and resilience plans from countries in the Alpine regions. And I am very pleased to say that they have made good use, or at least they have planned significant investments in digital priorities over the next few years. And of course, it is important, and, and I know, uh, of course, that your politicians, your representatives will uh, work very hard to ensure that uh, an important part of those investments also uh, benefit uh, the Alpine regions. So here we are. Uh, we have a vision. Um, we have a strategy. You have a strategy. It's a European strategy. It's a strategy that you are implementing at regional level, across borders. Um, there is an engagement at local level, at regional level, at national level, at European level. So it's very important now we get going. In every crisis, there is opportunity. In, in every kind of revolution, and we are in a revolution, a digital revolution, a green revolution, there are opportunities. Let's make sure we, cre we use the momentum created by Europe's recovery to accelerate Europe's digital transformation and close the digital divide and turn the Alpine region in a thriving area, a digital Alpine region with a, with a very, very bright future. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much indeed, Mr. De Graaf, uh, also for this inspiring speech. I think uh, I'm very happy to uh, see that we are absolutely aligned in our reflections because uh, you also stressed on the one side the importance of infrastructure, of course, but then uh, it was uh, very interesting to see that you focused very much in your speech on uh, capacity building, on digital knowledge, digital skills. And this is ex exactly also reflected by what we are doing in uh, USAP, because on the one side we are discussing about digital infrastructures, but then we focus very much also on digital skills, capacity building, for instance, also with our approach to smart villages, because smart villages for us is not an infrastructure approach, it is an approach about uh, how to use the potential. So really about the capacities of people. So I think uh, we are really very much aligned. I haven't seen any question in the chat, but uh, I have nevertheless one or two, um, because you were also talking about uh, 5G. And you said that the objective of the European Union is now to have 5G by 2030 for everybody. But on the other side, you also mentioned that uh, people are sometimes scared by digitalization, by its complexity, and especially by 5G. There are a lot of discussions around on 5G. <coughs> so um, what, is ex what is your experience? How can we convince people that we really need 5G to uh, unleash the potentials of digitalization? Well, I mean, I, I think there's a number of things which we, we need to do. We need to communicate honestly uh, about the, the, the technology. I mean, people do have concerns about also the impact that it may have on, on health. I mean, the, the reality is, is that 5G is a much more decentralized technology than we've had in the past. It works a, a lot with what we call small cells. Uh, and that means that the emissions uh, are, are much smaller than, than the emissions that uh, we have been experiencing with 4G and, and 3G. But that's where we need an honest debate, also scientifically underpinned with experts and, and listen very carefully to the concerns that people have. I mean, I am not a technology person. I am not an engineer. I mean, I work in a technology field, but uh, sometimes I struggle. I have to actually ask my kids often, like, how does that work? I mean, what, what do I need to do? And I get stuck. Uh, and, and I think it's important that we don't um, uh, create expectations that people somehow need to understand the technology. I mean, what is important, like for 5G, if you are a farmer in the Alpine region, and, and you use uh, what we call Internet of Things, which is basically uh, putting sensors in your, in your field or, 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 or on your animals. You can actually uh, kind of do much more precision farming. You, your farming can become more productive, but it can also become more sustainable because you need to use less pesticides, you need to lose, use less fertilizers, which of course, I mean, we know with runoff, I mean, can cause serious harm to the environment. So the technology gives you the tools to be a, like a more effective farmer with a higher production, better crops, better, better kind of uh, livestock, but at the same time with a, a much lower burden on the, on the environment. And I mean, people, the, the farmer doesn't need to know exactly how it works or why he needs cloud services, because that, of course, it needs to, all that information needs to be brought together and needs to be made sense of. The only thing the farmer needs to know is like, okay, where do I need to spray? Uh, because there's some kind of disease that I have to address or uh, do I still need to give more fertilizer? Is there enough fertilizer in, in the field? That's all the farmer needs to know because that's what farming is about. Um, and, and, and so I think, and that is true also for people. And I think once people see the benefits of technology, uh, we know that kind of with hospitals, it's, it, that's difficult in, in, in lowly populated areas. The, the, the nearest hospital may be like a hundred kilometers away. And, and therefore, if you can have your doctor or a medical specialist kind of talk to you and explain to you and, 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 and help you if you have a particular medical problem, or, or if you are in a local hospital, that local hospital can be connected with a specialized hospital in another part of your country or even in another country where a surgeon can advise like how the particular surgery needs to be done in order for you to become healthy again. It's all done by technology, but it is under the hood. 
you don't need to know how it is how it is done but i think what we want to create is that people see technology as a positive force in their lives and that they are ready to use it they have enough skills to to to, to do an electronic bank transfer or to to know how to log on to to participate in a in a seminar or or to do online education that's what people need to know and then they will see the benefits and therefore it's very important that we always emphasize the application not technology itself but what technology can do it can give you access to better healthcare services it can give you access to your bank you don't have to go by car 30 minutes to 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 a local bank branch as an, as an entrepreneur, it gives you new customers, new opportunities to, to, to do the, the kind of the activity. As a craftsman, you can sell your products, your whatever your 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 uh, snaps um, to a, a much wider uh, set of clients. So I think that's what it is about. Let's keep the technology out of it as much as possible. Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. I think there, uh, there again, we are completely aligned because also as Action Group 5, we are on this uh, line saying that we need to better communicate all the potentials offered now, for instance, with uh, 5G. And as Action Group 5, we have also elaborated a collection of good practices, what uh, 5G can offer, for instance, in e-health, mobility, smart farming, etc. Well, uh, this document is also available, by the way, on the AG5 website of USA. So I think we are, we are really aligned and I think uh, this is the, the important thing. We need to communicate the potentials. And this is also why we are, we are here today. Uh, I, I dare, I, I know it's a complicated question, but if I may ask you a, a very, very short response on it. Uh, in the past, state aid rules were uh, very much conceived as a hindrance for the rollout of new technologies. Uh, can we hope for the future that this situation will be better, that there are some really more flexibility for the state of rules? Well, I, I like to say yes. I mean, <laughs> uh, and it has to, because it has taken, I mean, in many cases, I know some of these uh, kind of state aid applications from some of the Alpine regions uh, actually uh, have taken a very, very long time. Uh, and that is frustrating. Yeah, it's very frustrating if it takes two years for such a, uh, a case to be dealt with. I mean, it, we, we need to speed that up. Uh, we now have the recovery and resilience facility. I mean, we can't take two years or three years to, to approve a state aid case when, when the need for investment is now. Uh, and so that requires, uh, I mean, more clarity, clear guidelines, also what does not need to be notified. And a lot of the activities, particularly in the Alpine regions, where frankly the risk of distortion is, is minimal, I mean, should be exempted. I mean, a lot of it is already exempted and probably we will need to go further. And then when it's not exempted, we need to make it easy, easier to notify. And then we need to kind of, also as a commission, and it's, I mean, I speak a bit from, also for my colleagues in DG competition, we need to kind of have a decision before too long, within six months or, I mean, quickly. Uh, so I, I, we do recognize, we know it, it's often a frustration. At the same time, of course, I mean, it's important that we avoid distortion of competition. So state aid policy is absolutely justified and legitimate. And there are many at the instances where I think we're all happy that certain uh, funding is, is not uh, uh, taking place because it could significantly distort uh, conditions of competition. But, but as I think particularly for the Alpine regions where, where frankly people need the broadband connectivity, I mean, there needs to be massive investment in, in, in upskilling, uh, also in support to, 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 to crafts, to local, local businesses. I mean, we need to have a very flexible system in place that allows these investments to be made as soon as possible. That's what we owe, I think, Europeans, and that's what's what needed, particularly in the Alpine regions. We, we are in very strong, intensive debate with our colleagues in DT competition. So I am quite hopeful that we will uh, make uh, further further progress uh, on that line. But I, I, I hear what is behind your question. So I'll, I'll take that back again to my colleagues that there is an expectation in the Alpine regions that we, we do even more. There, there is an expectation and uh, I know that you are working on it. So this was the sense also to, to give you the opportunity to explain it. Um, in between, there have been uh, several questions on the chat now. For time reasons, I cannot take all of them, but one is very special and you can uh, really give a very short answer. There is a participant from Georgia. 
uh, in the Caucasus who is asking if there is also funding available from the European Union for a person or an activity in Georgia, so extra communitary activities on yeah. the field of digitalization. Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, and, and if the person kind of, I mean, he's very welcome to, to write to me. We have extensive programs uh, in the Balkans, also in what we call the Eastern Partnership, um, with a, a heavy emphasis on, on digital, with significant funding behind, because it's important, of course, that we, we digitalize kind of in Europe successfully, but it's also important that we support our, like what we call the neighborhood, uh, to not fall, fall behind. So the answer is yes, and, and, and I'm very happy to signpost uh, the, the, the colleague to the, to the right uh, uh, people in the Commission for, for further information. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry for the other two questions. Uh, I cannot take them now because we are slowly running out of time. Uh, Mr. De Graaf, thank you very much for having been with us. Uh, I think we are really much on the same line. So I hope that we can continue also our cooperation in the future. Thank you very much. Very exciting. Wish you all the best. Okay, thank take care. You. And right. now we switch because also Mr. De Graaf has already said uh, this is a topic that concerns a lot of uh, directorates general. And one of them, of course, if we are talking about rural areas, is DG Agri. And here we have uh, Silvia Michelini, who could join me now. Hello, Ms. Michelini. Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning. You are a director for rural development at uh, DG Agri. And uh, Mr. De Graaf already said uh, what you are going to say now, because uh, you can now really uh, mention also the different programs that are underway. And I'm sure that you will also talk about the uh, long-term vision for rural areas that is being prepared now. And if I'm right, will be publicly presented in very few days. So, Ms. Michelini, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas. So I'm very happy to be here in this conference, uh, sitting as uh, uh, Mr. De Graaf in uh, Brussels, the sunny Brussels today after several bad days. Um, I'm, uh, well, just a bit from my background, I am born very far away from the Alps in Italy, down in the south, close to the sea, a few kilometers from the sea, but uh, I had uh, the opportunity to appreciate um, that area of the Alps and uh, to, to see and to, uh, to appreciate the attractions, uh, tourism, uh, uh, local products, businesses, uh, agriculture, special agriculture, the culture itself. Self. So I'm very much, uh, um, I'm very happy to be here today in this conference, which uh, uh, puts together digital and Alps, so really two um, key elements. And I'm very also glad to be here uh, today when there will be this uh, launching of the network, uh, and I wish uh, all the best for this uh, launching today. So, uh, indeed, as you said, uh, Mr. De Graaf uh, looked uh, um, at, uh, at the issue in particular with a focus on digitalization. And in my presentation, and I have some slides which uh, we could start to put up um, in the video, uh, indeed, in the uh, following slide, you will see uh, the outline of my presentation. I uh, am director, as you said, of rural development in DG Agri, and we are indeed um, working working a lot uh, on several issues relating to the smart villages. So if we go to the next slide, I will uh, uh, outline uh, the different activities which we've had in the last few years on this and also what we learned from it. And then indeed, as you said, Thomas, this gives me the opportunity to highlight the future um, initiative of the Commission, the long-term vision for rural areas, and connected to that also the different funding opportunities uh, which are out there including for mountain and alpine areas. So um, I will start uh, in my next slide with um with a bit of background and indeed we we've been working for a few years as you said um, in 2017 we launched uh, an eu action for smart villages uh, and indeed in this uh, in this action we started uh, the reflections on uh, possible initiatives uh, uh, strategies and models for uh, smart villages to um, to to start and uh, to uh, to use different uh, opportunities uh, coming from rural development regional 
development, research, transport, energy, digital, and so on. And there was a momentum building up also uh, in the course of the years. In uh, 2018, you uh, remember the Bled Declaration for Smarter Future of the Rural Areas, which was endorsed by the Parliament and by the Commission. And also following that, uh, pilot projects and preparatory actions also uh, took place, uh, again, to, um, to um, highlight the different opportunities and see uh, what could be done in this area. And uh, continuing with the next slide, indeed, we had... Uh, uh, the, uh, we launched in 2017 the European Network for Rural Development thematic group of smart villages. It was a, a, a very good initiative which looked uh, at several uh, things. We wanted to see which practices are out there uh, because smart villages are uh, out there and starting to, to produce results. So we wanted to see that, collect uh, practices, disseminate them, replicate them as well as uh, also the high representative of the region of Friuli Venezia Giulia just uh, indicated. We also looked at um, the possibilities for funding and how to make it easier for villages who wanted to become smart to, uh, to use those opportunities. And there were also the two preparatory actions on uh, Smart Rural 21, which we launched uh, um, last year, and then Smart Rural 27 from this year. Again, with a, a lot of collection of, uh, of uh, um, possible opportunities, testing uh, opportunities for um, villages who wanted to, to become smart. And uh, connected to that also um, Horizon projects, uh, the European, uh, uh, the Interreg Alpine Smart uh, Villages, Alpine Space Smart Villages as well. So um, I would say that uh, uh, from all these activities, we gathered quite a lot of information. And uh, one thing I would like to, uh, to highlight is uh, uh, in the next slide that from uh, uh, the pilot project on smart eco -vi social villages, we gathered uh, um, a concept, a definition of smart villages. Uh, it may look a bit abstract, but it's, uh, it's quite uh, good to have uh, an idea of what it is, because sometimes we talk about smart villages and we ask, what is it exactly? And uh, well, it's, um, it's communities, of course, in rural areas. They, um, the characteristic is that uh, they use these innovative digital solutions to uh, solve problems which they have um, and to uh, develop further uh, in terms of um, uh, environment, uh, uh, social and economic uh, aspects. They build on part participatory approach, and again, this conference here, I think it's it's part of this uh, participatory approach involving stakeholders and uh, really getting a bottom uh, bottom up um, uh, bottom up information uh, to uh, build on local strength and opportunities. So working really with communities and with actors in urban and rural areas together, uh, even with this uh, uh, strong uh, connection between the two. Um, and then using new initiatives, but also building on, uh, on existing initiatives and putting them uh, together. So I think this corresponds a lot to the actions and to the achievements that you are also carrying uh, out and that you have in mind also for the future, even with this launching of the, um, of the network uh, today. So uh, moving to the next slides, what are the lessons which we have learned is that indeed smart villages are there. Uh, they are um, they are actually uh, making uh, life of citizens easier, as also Mr. De Graff was saying. We need to see what what makes um, what the technology can bring us in terms of advantages in our everyday life. They find solutions uh, in uh, uh, from health to agriculture to uh, businesses, tourism, um, uh, and so on. Uh, they're not a measure. So, for example, in rural development, we don't have a specific measure of smart villages, but we have several funding opportunities for that. But it's more an approach, uh, putting together um, brains uh, to uh, and use the technology to solve um, issues and also to harness the opportunities of, uh, of these uh, um, areas and uh, putting together also complementing uh, various uh, initiatives.
And now this gives me uh, the opportunity to uh, highlight the, um, the vision for rural areas, the long-term vision. And moving to the next uh, slide, I would like to quote the president of, uh, of the commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. With, um, she, uh, in the um, political guidelines, already mentioned rural areas. Uh, and here I quote, she uh, said, our rural areas are the fabric of our society and the heartbeat of our economy. And this is really uh, the core uh, idea of uh, on which we are working, uh, together with the concept of diversity. Uh, indeed, even if we look at mountain areas, um, there are uh, there is a variety of uh, of situations. We have uh, mountain areas which have, for example, uh, a GDP per capita which is quite low, but others where the GDP per capita is even higher than the EU average. So there is such a diversity when we look at the geography, when we look at demography. Uh, um, when we look at business opportunities, that we cannot have one size fits all approach. So we are uh, in our thinking about the vision, also looking at this diversity. And this is very much also in line with uh, your concept of uh, really harnessing the diversity and, uh, and using it to the best. So we are um, thinking about all these elements and we are uh, putting together a, a, a vision uh, which is, as you indicated, Thomas, scheduled to be adopted end of June 2021, uh, which embraces all the different aspects, economic, social, environmental aspects of rural areas and where, of course, the digitalization will have also indeed a key uh, role. Um, if we go to the next uh, uh, slide, uh, um, it's a colorful slide uh, and it may seem a bit conceptual, but uh, I think I, I wanted to present it to you here because it gives a bit also an idea of how um, we uh, we proceeded with this vision. I, um, there are two main building blocks, I would say. One is the analysis and the foresight. Uh, and the other one is the public consultation and public engagement on which I will co go back. On the analysis and foresight, we have used a lot of data, a lot of, uh, uh, of um, uh, studies which are out there. Uh, we reviewed um, what, uh, uh, I mean, relevant uh, information. But also, given that it's a vision, so we are projecting ourselves in the future, uh, we also need some foresight element to, uh, to imagine possible uh, futures and combination of futures. And we worked a lot um, with uh, our joint research center, which is a commission department uh, looking in particular at research uh, and foresight issues. But we are also uh, working with, um, with a lot of stakeholders, managing authorities, experts, and so on. And with putting together all these uh, brains, uh, we came up with some uh, um, scenarios, which are uh, a simplification, if, uh, if you will, but give some ideas, some indications. And here in this um, in this uh, um, picture, you will see that we looked in particular at two drivers for the future. One is the demography, which is represented in the vertical axis. So we have on the bottom uh, uh, demography uh, areas with, with a demography which is uh, um, shrinking. So out, uh, migration towards urban centers or low migration towards rural areas. But at the top, we have expanding rural areas with more migration to rural areas itself. I mean, uh, an, um, a real possibility we have seen also uh, in times of, of COVID. And then if we look at the uh, horizontal axis, we have uh, the governance aspect, which is another important driver for the future. And again, we have um, fragmented rural areas on the uh, left-hand side uh, with uh, uh, limited collaboration and cooperation between um, uh, actors of the rural areas and network uh, the other extreme networked rural areas, so with a lot of um, collaboration and, and collective uh, uh, participation even to, uh, to the public life. And uh, if I, um, so in the top uh, part of this, um, let's say in the um, uh, red, in the blue and the green parts, we see uh, rural areas which are expanding on the demography and in the lower part, uh, rural areas which are shrinking. And the same also for the governance on one side, um, uh, fragmented and on the other side, networked. So if I look, if I connect a bit these, uh, uh, these um, uh, colors with, uh, with the 
smart uh, villages in the alpine areas uh, i see that your objective is really to go towards green so expanding and networked uh, rural areas where you have um, smart uh, villages uh, uh, which are replenishing um, countering uh, aging countering uh, the population and also uh, looking at connecting uh, those connecting people through also technology. So I think this, um, this conceptual slide helps us also uh, see uh, what is the, the future uh, we are looking for and also um, connects with, uh, with your objective, I think. Now moving to uh, to the next slide, I think it's uh, um, um, Gerard de Graaf also indicated the challenges and, uh, and opportunities for rural areas. And indeed, um, in our work, uh, we um, and also he mentioned the different divides. Indeed, we have uh, um, challenges which are common to uh, to the areas, uh, although to different degrees, because as I said, there is a wide diversity. But overall, we can say that demography, economy, uh, delivery and access to uh, access to services, connectivity, of course, but also um, uh, categories of uh, uh, people in particular situation, youth, also people with disabilities, gender balance issues are also important. So there is um, um, a wide range of, uh, of challenges uh, which are there. But uh, our objective is also uh, not only to cope with these challenges, but also to to um, take advantage of the opportunities which uh, which rural areas are, and I see many in the in the alpine regions. Indeed, um, if we look, for example, at, at the co contribution the alpine region gives to the ecosystems, um, this is uh, really important. And if we look also at the at the contribution of agriculture, at the contribution of, uh, of forestry, uh, bioeconomy, circular economy. Putting all this together really gives a lot of uh, opportunities and business opportunities for the regions. Um, we look, of course, uh, um, overall at the ecological and, uh, and green transition. So there is a very strong link with the Green Deal. Um, as I said, the COVID-19 crisis has had some um, indirect effect as well in terms of also um, more appreciation for rural areas, for more remote areas in terms of also uh, distancing, uh, social distancing. And then there is also a very high potential for innovation and uh, your uh, experience shows it, uh, the high potential for social innovation, for uh, digital innovation, for uh, sharing knowledge, sharing best practices. And in general, I think uh, there is also an um, appreciation for the quality of life and sense of belonging, which is particular to, um, to these rural areas. So, um, Silvia, moving to sorry, the... Sorry for okay. interrupting you, we are quite short in time. If you could go a little bit fast through the last slides. Okay, Sorry. sure. Thank you, Thomas, for uh, for uh, showing that to me, for indicating that to me. So in the next slide, that would be very quick. We, we had a lot of... Um, public engagement uh, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, success uh, with interventions from different stakeholders with a number of, ev of events uh, up to the Rural Vision Week uh, um, end of March. So all this to collect uh, feedback from stakeholders but also to, um, to uh, share uh, the ideas we collected from them. And therefore, we, uh, I would like to go uh, to the next slide because I think it's important uh, uh, the support uh, uh, funding uh, to, um, uh, uh, to to smart villages and to rural areas in general. So, uh, as Gerard said, um, there are many opportunities. The cohesion policy um, is there to help recovering resilience facility. Uh, Gerard also indicated in particular the options for the digital side. Uh, but I would like to uh, focus a bit on, uh, on the common agricultural policy. And there I would move very quickly to the next slide. Uh, we have um, um, a common agricultural policy reform which is in uh, uh, in the making um, and and there um, I think it's important for the for smart villages to take the opportunity of uh, the enhanced strategic approach of the next next common agricultural policy so we want member states together with the local um, uh, stakeholders to design uh, to identify their needs including the needs of your villages and come up with a um, 
interventions to support them and then we have a lot of uh, um, options from investment support uh, to uh, local development initiatives so leader uh, basic services small scale infrastructure um, capacity building and knowledge so there is a wide range of, of options um, which are there to sustain um, the smart villages uh, um, agriculture forestry uh, and uh, other opportunities in uh, um, connected uh, economic sectors so it, it is important to take uh, these uh, opportunities which are there um, indeed and with this i um, move to the conclusions to uh, keep the time so i think it's uh, for the next uh, slide for me um, smart villages really represent a very um, interesting tool to help meet future challenges. Uh, this uh, local ownership and participatory approach is really a key feature of it, and this is something which we are uh, very much also working on on the long-term vision. So I'm very happy um, that I had the possibility to, to talk to you today, and uh, I will be happy also um, when uh, the Commission communication on the long-term vision will be adopted end of June. Uh, if you could have a look at that and see also the opportunities uh, and and uh, I'm sure that you will see a lot of uh, um, reflections and alignment, as uh, Thomas said, with your uh, vision uh, in there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia. And sorry for having interrupted you. Um, we are a little bit late in the program. We will have maybe 20 minutes of delay. Uh, this is also a bit of my fault because I also wanted to, to, to ask the questions that are there on the floor. <laughs> And um, first of all, thank you, Celia, really much, very much for your presentation. I think once again, we see that we are completely aligned with uh, what the Commission is doing and what we are preparing in, in USAID, in Action Group 5, with the Smart Villages Initiative, etc. And we will, of course, be happy to cooperate also with the Commission in the future. And I think the long-term vision gives us exactly, as you said, the opportunity to do it. There was a question, a very precise question in the chat. I, can, I do not know if you can answer it, but the question question is, when exactly will the vision be published? Is there a concrete date or is it just end of June? Uh, we are uh, aiming at uh, really end of June, uh, so it should be the, the 30th of June according to the latest information, but certainly, I mean, you will see it by the end of June uh, published. Okay, thank you. So this question is answered and I take one question which was raised before with Gerard de Graaf, but I think it fits very well to what you presented now, because uh, the question was, uh, how can we combine traditional values of Alpine regions and new business models derived from the digitization? And the question was also, should we focus on the activation of participative, participative sorry, processes at the local level, linking old and new inhabitants of the Alps? And I think the, the easy answer to give is, is the smart village approach. Uh, do you share this, this, uh, this response? Thank you. Yes, I mean, indeed, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great question in the sense that this is what we are looking for. Huh? We want to keep the, the traditionality and the, the, local, uh, um, the local aspects. I mean, for example, if we look at the mountain areas, we have all these local products, uh, agricultural products, but others, we have all these traditional uh, ways of doing business. What we want is not to, um, to uh, take out the nature of this area, it's rather to, uh, to harness all these use using the, the new technologies, using the digitalization and giving businesses the opportunity to, uh, to expand uh, um, still with a root on the local traditions. And indeed, as you say, smart villages are one good tool to, to connect in this sense, and there are other tools as well out there. Um, in the vision, we really want, uh, and you will see it, we keep a lot of focus on the local traditions, on uh, on uh, uh, the way we do things, which is also a bit of our branding, eh? the brand of uh, of uh, what we do in Europe, and we want to preserve it. Uh, and there, I I go back to my quote of the president of uh, of the commission. It's really that concept which we want to to promote. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia. Thank you very much for having been with us. I have understood that you will stay until the end to see also the launch of the network. So uh, I'm very happy to, to see you maybe also later again. So thank you very much for your presence. Thank you. Okay.
We will now move on. We were on the European level. We have heard a lot about the vision of the European Commission, DG Connect, DG Agri. But uh, now we are discussing here within USALP, the macro region strategy for the Alpine area. Uh, we are one of nine action groups uh, dealing with digitalization. And uh, I think uh, digitalization has become one of the major topics now for this uh, macro region strategy. And I'm very pleased to have now Christian Barret with me. Christian Barre is the general delegate for the USA yes. uh, from the French presidency. Hello, Christian. Um, Hello. She's, she, yes, we are hearing you. She's uh, chairing the executive board. She's chairing all the meetings. And it would be interesting to hear from you now. What, what is your vision on digitalization? How important is it for USA? Christian, the floor is you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas uh, Egger. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to uh, to speak today in uh, this uh, conference, and uh, I salute uh, the, all the participants of this meeting. Very uh, interesting. I warmly th thank the organizers of this meeting and co-leaders and members also of USALP Action Group Five. May we have the slides, please? Thank you. The first one. Thank you. Uh, as we have just heard, uh, digitalization is a paramount importance for all regions in uh, Europe, uh, especially in the post-COVID world. And among it, the dynamics in favor of smart villages is a strategic priority uh, in Europe. And uh, the words of uh, Sylvia Micheli showed uh, us uh, this importance. As, uh, early, um, as early as uh, 2015, the European Union strategy for Alpine region recognized several challenges for the EU Alpine macro region directly related to its digital uh, development. Uh, first one, economic globalization, which requires the macro region to distinguish itself as a competitive, innovative and exemplary uh, region, which therefore requires important efforts for the enterprises, digitalization, digitalization especially the SMEs. Uh, demographic trends which are characterized, characterized by the combined effects of an aging population, low population density in mountain areas, and new migration patterns, which therefore increase the necessary use of digital services in order to satisfy the need of the people living in these uh, mountains. Third, high vulnerability uh, to climate change and its, and its foreseeable effects on the environment, biodiversity, and the living conditions of its uh, inhabitants, which requires digital tools for data collection, modeling, and uh, forecasts. Uh, then, the energy challenge of managing and uh, meeting demand on a sustainable, secure, and affordable way, which requires the development of digital tools for energy eff efficiency, like smart grids. Then its geographical position in Europe as a transit region, which requires digital tools for data collection. Um, for data collection, modeling, planning, regulation, and forecasts as well. And a high degree of seasonality, especially in uh, certain tourist areas, which requires digital touristic marketing and services, as well as an information system suitable for vehicle flow management and continuity of logistics. Connectivity and digital uses are essential to effectively address each of these challenges. Uh, 
slide. Uh, next slide, please. This is why the Alpine Macro uh, Regional Cooperation has been uh, structured around the digital issue through Action Group 5, digital connectivity and accessibility of services to the public. Important works on these topics have already been carried out, as you heard on uh, yesterday's session, and many projects continue to see the light. Next slide, please. One of the great uh, added values of USALP is addressing this topic of digitali digitalization is its inclusive governance, allowing crossing expertise, expertise and the involvement of public and private stakeholders. Thus, as you know, Action Group 5, which is co-led by the Swiss Group for Mountain Regions, and the autonomous region of the Aosta Valley brings together, with the support of the European Commission, experts from the states and region or canton of the Alpine region, as well as uh, sub-regional authorities and civil society organizations. USALP also addresses the digital challenges of the Alpine macro region at a relevant perimeter that of the territorial ecosystem formed by mountain territories, valleys, villages and cities. Indeed, in order to deploy digital infrastructures and develop their use in rural and mountain territories, solidarity and cooperation with the valleys and cities are necessary. This is the founding principle of USALP, solidarity, and cooperation between cities, valleys, and mountains. Next slide, please. The French uh, USAL presidency, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of work has already uh, been carried out on these topics. Under the French uh, presidency, some new steps have been taken in uh, 2020 and 2021. Last October, the event of Smart Villages, organized by uh, the ADRETS Association, Association for the Networked Development of Territories and Services, gathered us in uh, the Vercors. Uh, the ADRETS Association is composed by local actors wishing to work and share resources for the development of access to services of general interests in the rural areas of the French Alps. The presentation and field visits nourished, uh, re reinforced the, co the consideration of digital connectivity and the mountain territories and the development of digital issues as a priority. Mountain territories have their place to take the, in the evolution of lifestyles in the area of digital technology, telecommuting, supply platforms, in short circuit, and of course, in adaptation to the effect of the sanitary crisis. Next slide, please. I'm uh, very pleased that uh, following the project Smart Villages, co-founded by the Alpine Space Programme, will now lead uh, to the setting up of an op operational cooperation network among Alpine territories, which are involved into such smart approach, which, uh, of course, uh, make best use of digitalization, but also reinvent the way how to live and develop a territory in an inclusive and participatory ways. The support to the implementation of the Smart Villages approach in the Alpine region is underlined in the USALP manifesto uh, we adopted uh, last June 2020. This manifesto states the priorities for joint action for the coming years on digitalization 
the commitment is to ensure uh, digital connectivity as well as balanced living and economics development opportunities and mutualized solutions between rural and metropolitan areas to support the development and competitiveness of the region and to better achieve the objectives of sustainability and green economy in the Alpine region. This priority is now intended to be included in, and uh, supported by the next European Union funding programs managed by the regions, whether regional, interregional, cross-border or transnational. This priority is also intended to be supported by the European funds managed directly by the European Commission and by the various contracts between the state and the communities. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like also to pay uh, tribute to the Action Group 5, who has been very reactive in the rush of the COVID-19 pandemic by sharing useful be best practices in e-health and the contribution of smart villages to strengthen the resilience of the Alpine territory. The document is published online on the USALP website. Finally, I would like uh, to emphasize that it's very important for the French presidency to include young people. It's uh, like a red uh, uh, thing uh, uh, along the presidency in USALP. And I'm pleased to see once again their voice is taken into account also for the thematic of digitalization because they have a lot to, to bring to us. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention and I wish, I wish uh, the rest of the day will be uh, fruitful as uh, yesterday and this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for giving us an insight on your vision from the presidency view. You have a very particular presidency because this is the only presidency maybe that will run for two years, also due to the yes, COVID-19 crisis. <laughs> so uh, it's a lot of work for you, I know, and we are very happy that, that you're here with us and uh, we can share our visions. And yes, indeed, uh, young people are very important also for us. So uh, they, we gave them the voice yesterday and we will take up this voice again now after the break into the discussion with the panelists. Uh, I've seen no questions in the chat for you. And as we are a little bit late uh, in the timing, I hope uh, that you forgive me that we will not have a, now a discussion, um, but that we go into the break. So thank you very much again, Christian, for being with us and uh, hope to stay, that you can also stay for the rest of the day with us. And now we go into the break. We are a little bit late, but we still need some coffee, I think. So I would say that we have 15 minutes of break. So we will meet again at 10.35, not 10.30 as indicated in the program, but 10.35. Enjoy your break and see you later. Welcome back from the coffee break. Uh, I hope you had time to recover a little bit. Uh, I know it is a long morning with a lot of discussions, but I hope they are interesting for you and that you can prop benefit uh, from the discussions. I did not hear the audio of the video before, so I was a little bit hesitating, but it seems that now everything is working fine. We are now moving into a panel discussion and I'm looking very much forward to this panel discussion and uh, I would like to introduce to you now the speakers and the participants of the panel discussion. Here they are. So welcome to the four panelists. Um, 
I will still start from the left to the right, even if they are uh, in different order now. So first of all, Jan Dröge, welcome. Can you hear us? Perfectly. Hello. Yeah, perfect. So welcome, Jan. You're director of the BCO network, the Broadband Competences Offices. This is a very important network where you are uh, directing um, the inf exchange of information and experiences. And I think this is a very important network that we can build on uh, together. Synergies we will discuss about this during the meeting. You were also already yesterday during uh, one of the workshops. So thanks for participating very actively. And then uh, the second on my screen is Ricardo Zanelli on uh, the old Good morning, good morning, Mr. The... Agar. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So on the old version of the program, you may have seen that there was Saverio Maestro. He's replaced actually by Ricardo because Saverio had an important other uh, meeting that he had to join. Yeah. So thank you for the flexibility, uh, Ricardo. You are a project manager at the mechatronics class from Friuli Venezia Giulia. And what is yeah. important for me, you are also a member of AG2, Action Group 2, subgroup Digital Industry. So we see that we are also building connections across the action groups. Indeed, indeed. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure for me. Thank you for joining us. And now we, the third person on the screen is Emilia stoimenova Du. Uh, welcome to you. Can you hear us? Good morning. Hey, Thomas. Nice to see you all. Hi, everybody. Everything seems to work. You're working at the University of Ljubljana. And what is important for us, you were one of the very active partners also in the Smart Villages project. You were uh, mainly responsible, for instance, for the policy recommendations, etc. So this will be interesting also to discuss with you about Smart Villages, the future of the Smart Village approach, and maybe also some connection on the policy level. So thanks for joining us. And the last person on the screen, but not the least important, of course, is Anna Giorgi. I think a lot of uh, the spectators, the public know very well Anna Giorgi. I do not have to present her in depth. She's uh, one of the key researchers, I would like to say, in the Alpine area. She is uh, very active from the University of Milano. She's very active in different fields. And she's here today because she's, uh, amongst others, leader of Action Group 1, which is dealing with research and innovation. So there's a very close connections to our activities in Action Group 5. And she's also a coordinator of several Alpine space program projects and other initiatives. So this will also be very interesting to build connections. Hello, Anna. Hello, hi, hi, Thomas, and hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this very interesting event. Thank you very much. Okay, so this was the short presentation round. And now, um, the first point is, is really, as I said yesterday, uh, yesterday we had the input from young people. And for us, this is really important uh, because the young people, they are the future and they have their vision and their understanding also of digitalization. And just to resume, maybe also for the, the four panelists, what uh, came out from yesterday's presentations by the young people. Uh, first of all, they said, when we are talking about problems, the major problem that we see is really the sometimes bad connections. So they have problems with digital infrastructures, especially, of course, in remote rural areas. And we are talking about them today also. What was interesting for me, and they didn't say it, that's why I say it now, they did not say that they have problems with technical knowledge. I think they are all digital native and they know how to use the tools. This was also very interesting for me. They did not speak about problems with, with this. So they have the competencies and the interest to use it. And they see uh, very much potentials. They see potentials, for instance, in homeschooling, uh, distance learning. They are uh, now actually at the universities, so they uh, see that there are potentials that uh, distance learning really works. They see also a potential for the digitalization of public services. They see uh, potential also for 
uh, a new organization of the daily work, really the business, meaning that we can uh, replace uh, physical meetings by online meetings, reducing travel time, etc. And they really see home office as one of the advantages for rural areas. And uh, this brings also less, uh, no, sorry, more quality of life thanks to less commuting. So they really see the advantages of uh, digitalization. And um, what was interesting is, nevertheless, they, uh, when we were talking about digital infrastructures before, a strong request uh, formulated by Lorenzo Giacomini yesterday was really to say, we need equal opportunities for all territories. Uh, if we do not have access to these services, then it is a hindrance that it's not equal to equal base, equal basic services. So we must really strengthen those uh, basic services. And he made also the link to something that we may simply forget. Uh, we are talking about digitalization, but digitalization depends on el electricity. If you do not have electricity, if you have a blackout, sorry. We are lost. <laughs> so we really have also have to think in an integrated way about all these services. This came up for me uh, very clearly from the presentation by the young people. And uh, interesting was then also Lena Lacker, who said, well, for me, a top priority would be the access to e-health. Because with e-health, we could, for instance, have electronic patient dossiers. So we could also have uh, electronic prescriptions. If you are ill, then you do not necessarily go to see the doctor. You can do it electronically, then go to the pharmacy or uh, even order it online. So this could really ease some work. And uh, she strengthens once again the point that we need uh, a digital transformation of education. And by this, she meant not the technological tools but more the competence of the teachers, not the students, but of the teachers. Uh, the students are aware of the competencies, they know how to use them, but sometimes those who uh, you should use them maybe do not have the skills. This was a little bit uh, a summary of, of uh, what came out yesterday. And maybe you were there yesterday. I'm not sure that all of you were there yesterday. I know that Jan, for instance, was there yesterday. So Jan, when, when you hear uh, these uh, reflections from the young people, what, what, what makes it think to you? What is, what is your reaction on that? Thank you, Thomas. Um, well, my first reaction is that I couldn't agree more. I agree 100% uh, with the opening statement that you made, which is all of that they have said is only possible if the connection is there. The connection is the conditio sine qua non for all of the other digital enablement. And I will get back to that in a second. Um, but really, whether it be e-health or government services or all these other things like home office is only possible if the basic connectivity is ensured and that requires infrastructure investments. Um, uh this is actually okay it's good that you asked me this question first <laughs> because this is so to say the core business of the broadband competence office network that the european commission has set up for those of you that could not be on the panel that we had yesterday the bco network so broadband competence office network is a project funded by the european commission similar in a way to the us alp uh, though it's for all member states and it's to bring together the public administrations dealing with a uh, broadband rollout, specifically for the areas where there's market failure, where the telecom operators are not investing because there's too low population density, there's no business case, or the geography makes the business case difficult. So this would apply to a lot of your, let's say, uh, audiences in, in the, let's say, more remote parts of the Alpine space. Therefore, if so, the outcome of the panel yesterday was if you are planning whichever of the countries in in the space you are from if you are planning uh, to try and overcome these hurdles of connectivity if you are a municipality or your regional government um please reach out to the broadband competence office in your region for nearly all of your regions be it uh, Piemont, Lombardy, uh, Savoie, uh, Vorarlberg, all of you 
have regional BCOs. There are uh, broadband competence offices in all of your regions, Bavaria, etc. Um, plus, all of your governments have significant funds to actually invest in this infrastructure. And you might say, okay, why then? Why isn't it happening? Because actually investment in broadband infrastructure is not that simple. It sounds simple, but even if there is public money, it's not always easy to use it because it's a regulated market and it's not easy to attract or to bring together, let's say, the funding with the investors, the, the, the telecom operators. So that would be my first. Please work with the BCOs to try and overcome these hurdles because the objective in the EU is that all citizens by 2030 30 uh, should have access to gig gigabit connections. So that's the first. So that's sort of say preaching for my chapel, if I may say. And then Thomas, if you allow me, I would just like to say uh, uh, one more thing that is sort of say not directly linked to my job, but just a reaction to the, I think very interesting remarks that you said this uh, discussion with the um, young uh, people brought out yesterday. And I think this is this aspect of uh, home office and basically digitization to be in an active economic and social integration. And I think the Alpine space has been very dynamic, as you all know, this is why you exist as an association since years. You are very dynamic in innovating in many aspects. I think um, uh, the service industry is already one of the booming industries in your region. But of course, it's very much driven often by tourism. But I think through the connectivity and digitization, as the your uh, young participants yesterday mentioned, you could move to a service industry that you are exporting, but in completely new sectors. You can be a graphic designer, an interpreter, uh, uh, an IT programmer. You can be anything in the service industry nearly and based in Haute-Savoie or in Vorarlberg or in Graubünden and service uh, customers in the United States or uh, in Sweden. Yeah. Um, so I think it allows in a way for you to have a more balanced what the, the speaker just before the break mentioned that seasonality is a big challenge for Alpine uh, uh, areas because a lot of the service industry is based on seasonal activity but you have this connectivity and you can have service workers if i may say that can live there all year long you can be a graphic designer uh, in the mid season and you do graphic design for uh, customers elsewhere but based in the alps so i think it will allow a kind of also economic uh, impact in in your region that will be beneficial so what I just wanted to react to that because I agree, so to say, with all of the things that your your participants yesterday mentioned. Thank you very much. Um, I always use the example of an architect. An architect today can can be in a very remote valley and design a skyscraper in uh, Washington or wherever. It does not play a role anymore with digitalization. Uh, Ricardo. Also, the, the same question to you when you have heard now what the young people uh, were discussing yesterday. I don't know if you were there yesterday. Well, yeah, but, uh, I'm actually, I'm totally. Please, please go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally aligned, uh, aligned with uh, what Mr. Drüge just said, and uh, with what youngster brought uh, yesterday. A personal point of view, I believe uh, that the way. Uh, to which young people are, view the rural and uh, mountain environments uh, is radically changing right now. A lot more and more um, until 30, uh, 30, 20 years ago, young people would stay to live uh, in their own villages, you know, uh, were seen as uh, um, having failed in their own life in a sense. But this is not the case anymore. And young people also no longer see uh, it that way. The digital age and new new models of health living, for instance, are uh, breaking stereotypes, are uh, elevating those environments uh, in a sense. Of course, we have uh, more and more uh, job opportunities in rural and mountain areas, thanks indeed to digitization of many jobs that you were saying uh, before. We have the opportunity to live uh, 
uh, in those areas also at a slower pace while uh, enjoying the, uh, the natural environment. Furthermore, I would like to point out that uh, the pandemic, the, the, the current situation, has just accelerated, you know, this trend, this changing uh, of view. Um, rural, uh, rural and, uh, and mountains are now valued as healthier environments, isolated from the pollution for uh, uh, overcrowding of large cities. And with this in mind, of course, uh, uh, there is an increasing a talk on the possibilities for uh, uh, repopulating rural and mountain areas. This is what um, was going on, what's, uh, what is happening uh, in Friuli Venezia Giulia in my, in my region. However, mm -hmm. without employment and uh, without uh, training opportunities, many young people are unable, are not enabled to launch uh, uh, their own projects uh, in their own regions, you know. So, uh, in this regard, of course, digitization and existence of a fast internet connection might support and backing for young people through uh, initiative to revitalize the, uh, the rural and mountain uh, environment. That's my, that's my point of view. So really, uh, you stress once again that uh, things are changing radically and once yeah. much, much, much more faster now with the pandemic, it has uh, increased a lot the speed of uh, digitalization. We have all understood okay. now how important it is. Yeah. Yeah. Emilia, I, I saw you smiling when I was talking about the young people. I think <laughs> you have your own reflection or, or, or do you share the reflections by Jan and uh, Ricardo? Yes, I do. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that you invited the young people to speak from themselves, because all the time uh, I would like to point out that we all think that we know the best what people in rural areas need, but let them speak for their, themselves because they are the ones who know that. And uh, I'm also very happy uh, the points they raised up because when we are speaking about rural areas, all the times we are speaking about the digital gaps in terms of knowledge and skills. And now we see that because of these young people, this digital gap in terms of knowledge and skills is reducing or it's not there anymore, but the problem stays with the connectivity. So uh, we can see what are really the problems. And another thing, and I had a, a very interesting discussion uh, this week with young people living in rural areas in Slovenia. And uh, from all of them, I heard that uh, similar like uh, your young people at the conference were there yesterday, they would love to live uh, in their home places. So it's, it seems that everyone uh, thinks that all the young people would like to move to the cities, but that is not true. Mm -hmm. They would like to stay at home. So the problem is uh, they don't have internet. If they have a good connection, then they can uh, first learn from home, have the uh, access to the basic services, and then later work from home. So it is very good that now we have a proof from the young people that they would like to live in the rural areas, which we always thought, no, they are leaving the rural areas, so we, we know the reason. And another thing is that maybe we are focusing on problems that are not there anymore like the uh, digital gap in terms of skills. So thanks a lot for inviting them uh, and letting them speak from themselves, for themselves. Thank you very much, Amelia, and thank you very much for, for stressing this point that uh, the actual missing gap is not on skills for the young people, but for uh, connectivity, finally. And this is then what we can discuss uh, later again with, with Jan and all of you. Uh, now, uh, Anna, you, uh, I know that you are working very much also with young people. But by the way, I can confirm what Emilia said. We had also investigated young people in Switzerland and 80%, 80% of them said, we want to return to our mountain villages if we can. Uh, I think the same situation is actually in Italy going on, Anna. How, how is your uh, impression? Uh, uh, I can confirm it, uh, this tendency, and it's my direct experience because, as you know, I manage uh, a university center, that, which is a detachment of, of the University of Milan, placed in a little village in the center of the Italian Alps. And now we have 
300 students coming from all over Italy. Uh, and not, not only from uh, mountain villages and not only local young, pe young people, but um, young people coming from uh, big cities, for example, they are interested in uh, experimenting uh, and uh, acquiring knowledge about how to uh, convert uh, the resources, specific resources of mountain areas in value and uh, live in mountain areas. And our experience is really uh, a kind of uh, uh, flagship uh, because uh, we started 200, to, to, uh, to more or less uh, uh, 20 years ago uh, here in Italy. And now um, we um, manage, for example, uh, a network of uh, 30,000 contacts uh, and of course, we manage it by using uh, uh, digital uh, and technology tools. Uh, we, for example, provide a very rich uh, agenda of seminars, which are, um, um, you can follow them in presence, but also um, in streaming, and you can then um, uh, follow them on demand uh, because we have a very uh, well organized the website where you can find uh, um, multimedia products and so you can reach everything regarding what we are doing uh, in that uh, little university center where we do also research regarding uh, mountain development and not only educational activities uh, and it works because um, we first the um, professors realized which are the priorities living there and which are the the uh, yes the, the topics we have to um, cope to, to to yes to cope the the problems we have to cope with uh, and uh, we reorganized the way of um, doing lessons and doing research and the interaction with local dimension is something very different uh, from the uh, interaction with uh, the uh, dimension of uh, big uh, cities and uh, metropolis and so on. So this is a, another very important uh, lesson uh, learned. And uh, technology and uh, digital connection is uh, really fundamental in order to create a virtual bridge uh, enabling uh, local dimension and uh, uh, metropolis to share knowledge, to capitalize experiences and to grow together. It, and it, believe me, it really works. It's not easy at all because it's a different model to be established, a different way of working. But from my point of view, it's the future. Okay, thank you. thank you, Anna, for this uh, also experience that you can bring in. I've already also been to Edolo and I know that this is a very good initiative. I can only recommend to build such initiatives also in, in other countries and to build networks of them. And I know that you are working on this topic. Now, now from this uh, very first round, we have seen, uh, Jan, that uh, digital infrastructures seem to be the major gap now. If we uh, project us now into a little bit into the future, let's say in the next five to ten years, uh, you are working especially on this topic of digital infrastructures. Do you do you really see that in let's say five to ten years we will uh, have no more digital divide concerning infrastructures in Europe? That we will have access in all remote areas, over all over the Alpine area? Uh. Thomas, I don't have a crystal ball, so I'm okay. not sure. Um, let me put it like this. The European Union had an objective that all citizens should have had access to 30 megabit download speeds uh, by 2020. So that just passed, whatever, six months ago, we passed the deadline and we missed it. Yeah, at that time, we it was not so bad. It was pretty good, 89%, uh, so just under 90% were achieved. 
but in rural areas, so we don't have a differentiation between mountain and other rural areas, but for rural areas, it was just under 60%. So there's a real gap. Yeah. So the areas that are not attractive for telecom operators to invest in continue to be a problem. And I fear that this problem is going to be exacerbated in the years ahead because the requirement for higher speed uh, investments, yeah, I, I mean, investments for higher speed connectivities, very high capacity networks, will further exacerbate this. Uh, the, the investors will probably continue to focus on the areas where they have, have the highest return on investment. So more densely populated areas, areas with easy, let's say, geographic um, uh, setup. Um, so in that sense, I fear that the, the, this is not going to be so easy to overcome the gap that it might, yeah. Uh, secondly, the future, if we move towards 5G, which I think is going to be a, an essential technology going forward, that requires actually a densification of the network. So we even, so a, a linear continuation of the investment will not be enough. We actually need an acceleration of the investment. Um, I, I, one of the speakers of, on the panel yesterday actually also explained this densification and th that one of the ways to mitigate and overcome uh, uh, these investment challenges is on the one hand, maybe um, higher reliability on software and on edge uh, computing along the network in order to, let's say, to simplify, yeah, let's not make it a technical discussion, but to, to boost the uh, capabilities. So the objective now is no longer that we have a uh, 30 megabit connectivity, uh, but we aim at gigabit connectivity for everyone. And there, even if we look now, so even in those areas where I just said we have 90% achieved of our target of last year, if we compare that to the very high capacity cap capability, we're only at 35% across Europe. In rural areas, only 17%. So we're giving ourselves 10 years to reach 73% of the population in rural areas. It's going to be a major challenge. So I hope we can achieve this. We will do everything we can. This is the raison d'être for the uh, BCO network. Um, but it is going to be very tricky. I would say that in mountainous areas or other areas with, uh, let's say, um, challenging geographies, uh, of course, the investment models and how you attract the investment is one element. I'm not going to repeat what we discussed yesterday because we went into that a little bit yesterday. But the other element is, of course, technology mix. Um, the future connectivity as we can predict now of course i don't know what the future technology will be but with the existing technology in order to get the best uh, service that is future proof we would like to roll out fiber uh, to the highest percentage of people possible but in remote locations and notably in difficult to reach remote locations this is probably not a realistic option and so there are actually quite a few technological solutions nowadays to do this. And if we have the right public policies to support this, we can for sure ensure that all the users in the mountain areas have access to very high capacity networks. Whether we will reach gigabit, I don't know, but I think we can at least, at least sorry, reach everyone with 100 megabit, which would be so much better than what we have now already. Yeah. So, and I think this should be the aim. It is possible. I think it's achievable, but it requires probably concerted action in order to use the, let's say, sparse funding in the most efficient way. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, at least in the EU states, I know, Thomas, you're from Switzerland, it's slightly different. But in the EU, the, there is just a, a, just now the programming for the recovery and resilience facility is happening in all of our countries. Italy is actually the flagship country uh, putting the highest percentage of its uh, money 
into um, digital transformation with a huge amount into reaching uh, gigabit speeds for all citizens. But the same is the case in France, in, 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 in other countries. So there is an opportunity to have this money available. But of course, when our governments vote this money in Rome or in Paris or whatever, they're, they're literally voting on budgets of billions of euro. They're not looking at small villages in mountains. It's f up to us now to make sure that some of this money reaches where it's the most needed. So in the most underserviced, most remote uh, areas. So Thomas, I know it was a little bit of a, a longer answer. I, I wish I could just say, yes, we will reach everyone, but I don't think it's so easy. I think we're going to have to work hard to get there. That's, that's why I always say uh, we should first roll out new technologies in remote rural areas and only afterwards in urban areas. So we could really bridge the gap and this would give us a comparative advantage. No, but uh, of course, uh, you cannot uh, look into the crystal mirror and uh, we have understood that uh, digitalization, digital infrastructures need a lot of investment and that we uh, need more money. And I think more money is available now also with the recovery fund. But on the other side, we need also less regulation. And this was my question before to Gerard de Graaf with the state aid rules, etc. So if you can speed up also from this side and even more important than if we are talking about 5G. So this was the point for the, for the digital infrastructures. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I'm switching to Emilia because there was an interesting question also on the chat. I know you cannot see it, but uh, I tried to, to translate it to you. Um, on the chat, the uh, question is addressed to you that uh, we need also online teaching and digital training centers in mountain areas that train for mountain job uh, specific fields. So connectivity and infrastructure linked with training on, of young people, enabling them to stay uh, for, and work at home for tomorrow. So the, the key message here from this question is really that we must also really train the teachers on the one side, but also uh, train for skilled jobs that are then available in mountain areas. Uh, this question was addressed to you, so I don't know if you can uh, uh, give your comment on it. Thanks a lot. It's excellent question, actually. And this is one of the topics I wanted to speak about. So thanks for the person uh, putting this question up. Uh, I totally agree. And here uh, I can see uh, how we can solve this problem or this issue. So we have digital innovation hubs. And uh, I think that digital innovation hubs are the perfect setting where people can get skills that they need. So for also the jobs uh, that are needed in these mountainous areas or whatsoever. So uh, we can have this uh, rural smart specialization if we need to, or we can have also for, for other jobs as well. You were mentioning uh, the example with the architecture here today. But uh, here I see another problem, and I would like to build on what uh, Jan was already explaining. It's about the investments. And same goes with the investments like the with the infrastructure. It is also with the digital innovation hubs. So uh, we have public investments now for uh, infrastructure, uh, and uh, we have public investment for digital innovation hubs, and this is the European digital innovation hubs. But we can see that the rural areas need such hubs as well, but nobody is speaking about that. So we had another discussion last week, uh, and uh, there was the person uh, from the European Commission, and I raised up this issue that, uh, some of uh, the hubs that are going to be funded uh, from the European Union because they will fund around 280 hubs from all over Europe. So at least 20, 25% of them must be uh, that uh, in the rural areas or dealing with issues that have the rural areas. So where these people can get these skills. And what Jan uh, was mentioning, so the investments, the private invest investments always go to the highly dense areas because uh, what private investors see is the economic return on investment. And here I see the role uh, of the member states or the European Union and so on, or the country, uh, uh, like in the case in Switzerland, uh, because uh, public funding needs to fill in these gaps. And uh, that is why where we need these policies to make the trade-off. So if the private investors are putting their efforts in the highly populated areas, then the country with public funding should cover up 
uh, these gaps. And here is uh, the same with the digital innovation hubs. So previously I mentioned 20 or 25% of the digital innovation hubs because around 24% of the population in Europe is living in rural areas. But maybe here we need even more hubs in the rural areas because we know that the hubs in the urban areas will get other investments uh, as well. So. Um, if anyone from the European Commission is listening or from the member states, please don't forget uh, about the rural areas when you are planning your uh, policies or I don't know your projects, your initiatives, that it is the country that needs to put more effort on the rural areas because the companies at the beginning will not. But once you show them that many interesting things can happen so that there is also some income generation uh, in the rural areas afterwards, uh, then they will start investing there as well. So this is also the case we have done. With public investments, uh, we started some pilot projects uh, where we showed cases uh, that are interesting uh, also for big companies. And after that, they started investing on their own. But first, the seed was with public investment. Okay, thank you very much, Emilia, for this uh, exhaustive response and uh, reminding us or drawing our attention to the very important role that digital innovation hubs can play. And I know that all countries have now uh, submitted their uh, different projects and I hope uh, most of them or they focused really on the rural areas. We, we, we have uh, with Ricardo now also a representative from a cluster strategy. Yep. And I think this, this, lead, this leads me really to the point we were discussing now about young people, about people in general living in rural area. But we should not forget that we have also enterprises and uh, you are supporting yeah, those enterprises. Are, are those enterprises really fit for the future for the next five to ten years? Or how can we help them really to foster, master the digital transformation, Ricardo? Well, <laughs> tough question. I mean, it depends. Um, I'm working, as you, as you were saying, um, for, um, for a cluster organization, the cluster for the uh, advanced manufacturing here in Friuli Venezia Giulia, representing around uh, 3,800 enterprises working mainly mechatronics, uh, metal processing and uh, mechanics. Uh, the cluster, the organization is, a, is the, the outcome of a process driven back in the days by our regional administration in 2015, um, aimed at creating a kind of network of uh, several players that could favor the, you know, the aggregation uh, of players active in, uh, in the field of research uh, and uh, innovation. Um, you know, first point, the level of uh, um, implementation in Europe and Alpine regions uh, is still low, especially if we compare to other regions in the world, I think, uh, about the US or Japan, for instance. Um, this is mainly due to the lack of uh, workforce digital skills and, uh, uh, and uh, of course, infrastructure. Uh, so, um, first point, uh, primary requirements to enable uh, most of the new technologies at the in industry level, it's broadband uh, coverage, good internet connection, and not, uh, and, uh, and this is the first, uh, the first uh, point. Um, potentialities, opportunities uh, uh, from coming from the digitalization and the, this uh, kind of revolution at the end are huge. Uh, especially for manufacturing companies and SMEs. Uh, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, seek, of course, uh, uh, cost uh, effectiveness and uh, reliability on new technologies. They have uh, uh, difficulties with uh, investment capabilities. I would like to add that uh, uh, digitalization measures are only successful when uh, the company managers, or at least the shifts, or the the, the 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 management of the of the company, you know, uh, want uh, effectively to support uh, to support them. We know that uh, SMEs, manufacturing SMEs, of uh, of course, uh, this is my my target, the target of our organization, tend to have uh, small management teams that they are uh, very very busy with their day-to-day -day 
activities, they are overwhelmed by other tasks on a daily basis, so they have little time to identify and implement the potential offered by, by digitization. So uh, in this sense, I see, uh, um, I see a, big, a big potential, a big role uh, played by, by the digital innovation hubs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Stajamen Monova, I'm sorry for the pronunciation um, we're referring to. I agree with, with her on the um, importance of the digital innovation hubs. The European Union has created them in order to support European manufacturing SMEs in their digital transformation path. Companies over there can find valuable support. There will be uh, a lot of money, you know, in the next, in the coming years in order to uh, better understand the opportunities for digital transformation and to uh, receive personalized advice uh, on how to improve uh, also operators, um, operators uh, um, workforce uh, uh, skills and efficiency. In my region, in Friuli Venezia Giulia, the digital innovation hubs are managed, uh, managed under an umbrella initiative uh, called uh, Industry Platform for Friuli Venezia Giulia. Uh, my organization is fully integrated within uh, this kind of regional ecosystem. Cluster Comet is a founding member of uh, a digital innovation hub on advanced manufacturing solutions uh, called the DX, which is the first experiential digital innovation hub in Italy developed uh, according to to the guidelines of the, the Italian National um, Industry 4.0 plan. We are partner of another digital innovation hub at local level, focused on uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence, which is uh, becoming more and more relevant to our companies, even if it's becoming also a buzzword, let's say. And um, so we are carrying out uh, a bunch of activities within this framework, with this this uh, um, initiative called EP, EP4, IP4, Friuli Venezia Giulia, uh, in order also to reskill, upskill uh, the workforce of our of our companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much for, for stressing once again also the role of the digital innovation hubs. Just a very short question, which interests me personally. Your cluster that you're also representing is it also yeah. part of some uh, alpine wide network? Do you have exchanges as cluster with other clusters, or are you working isolated? No, no, we are working. Um, we have a, a, a good, a good European transnational network. Uh, I personally represent the Friuli Venezia Giulia position, uh, as you were you were saying, at the USALP uh, subgroup Digital Industry. Uh, led by Hub Innovazione Trentino. Uh, we are partners of uh, several uh, European funded projects. Plus, we represent the position of, uh, of our regional administration at the so-called uh, um, smart specialization uh, thematic platforms uh, on efficient sustainable manufacturing, on uh, high production through uh, 3D pr printing. Those are initiatives um, led and uh, managed by the JRC, the Joint Research Center, that have the ultimate goal, you know, to put in network uh, uh, different actors uh, um, and uh, ecosystem and uh, regional ecosystem. So, um, so replying to your, to your answer, we have a, a big, a big uh, connections. Uh, uh, but I never heard about uh, the digital, you were referring to the digital network or something like that. I never heard about it before, unfortunately. But of uh, course, we yeah. are we are open and keen to explore uh, synergies and uh, further collaborations. This was the aim of uh, this morning and this discussion. So uh, thank you for this openness. I'm, I miss it, I have to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was also one of the outcomes of the Smart SMEs project that we was just finished uh -huh. yesterday, where we said we want to build a network really of those uh, helping SMEs to become smarter. So maybe we will get in contact yep. with you and other people also in future. Sure, sure. Now,
Now, uh, Anna, you're one of the you're the, the leader of Action Group One, and in this function, you have a pretty good overview of the research and innovation scenery in the Alpine area. Uh, what is your impression on that? And do you think that we can use all, all this knowledge that you have, all the experience and knowledge that is on the university level, really to bring it down to the SMEs? Maybe, I don't know, maybe the A-Ring project that you are leading uh, could help us in that sense, no? <laughs> uh, yes, we hope, of course, <laughs> to be useful in what we are doing. And the Action Group 1, uh, as you know, uh, uh, deals with the research and innovations and the main aim is uh, to promote networking uh, uh, between uh, universities, research centers, enterprises in order to uh, promote innovation uh, in the Alpine region, which is uh, a very, very active region, uh, rich in university, in very um, important universities and research centers with a high level performances. So um, the, 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 the challenge is to try to uh, uh, to, to focus the attention of uh, these very important universities and research centers on the priorities uh, regarding the Alpine region, uh, of course. And this is what uh, uh, the Action Group 1 is uh, uh, doing, uh, working also uh, uh, within uh, the ARING project, uh, um, involving uh, uh, partners from uh, all the, 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 the states, uh, the Alpine states, uh, in uh, preparing a kind of research agenda, common research agenda. The first point is which are the priorities again? Which are the uh, priorities for, uh, for, for uh, the entire Alpine region? which are the topics on which we have to um, uh, join forces because everyone, every state, every region of the Alpine area uh, will get benefits if we work on that topic. Uh, it's not easy, uh, but it's clear that uh, uh, everything dealing with uh, uh, technology and digitalization is important because the Alpine region is special because it has the Alps at the center. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's a unique place in the world uh, where you have uh, little villages uh, place uh, in, in, uh, uh, which are far from everything uh, in, 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 in a place where uh, in, in few kilometers you can find big cities and metropolis. So you have to um, preserve biodiversity, for example, and uh, at the same time you have uh, uh, a, an industrial development impacting on nature and biodiversity. So uh, there are a lot of things uh, which are specialities of the Alpine region on, on which we have to focus on. And we are discussing and we are uh, uh, trying to uh, promote the attention of the universities and research centers on this topic. And now we are promoting, um, as Action Group 1, the creation of a, a, um, an Alpine Region Universities Alliance. Because uh, um, in such a way, we can try to uh, facilitate a process providing to the Alpine region a kind of uh, common uh, university system uh, working, also using, uh, mainly using uh, technological and digital tools, of course. Um, and uh, another uh, objective, uh, another uh, point in, in the agenda of the Action Group 1 for this year is uh, promoting uh, a, an Alpine level uh, master on uh, tourism, uh, regarding in particular uh, the, the, uh, the Alpine, uh, the, the, the mountain areas, of course, because they are suffering a lot uh, 
uh, the, the, the touristic set, the tourism sector is uh, suffering a lot as a consequence of the pandemic event, of, uh, of course. And uh, we are um, working with a group of, of universities uh, of uh, uh, four uh, alpine countries in order to um, yes, to, to uh, promote a master um, which will be held uh, in uh, e-learning modality, of course, uh, with some uh, training session uh, in the different alpine region and states, uh, but uh, with uh, a part of uh, uh, the course uh, um, done by e-learning uh, e uh, modality. And these are the main activities we are promoting as Action Group 1 in the Alpine region uh, based on <laughs> the use of technology and uh, digitalization, which is necessary, of course. And I'm sure we will go <laughs> in the future in that direction. Um, I don't I'm, know. I'm very, I'm very, I'm very um, happy to, to hear your explanations, but uh, this is really the core of USAP, of course, to build network synergies across the Alpine area. Yeah. And if you are now creating a network, for instance, of the universities in the Alpine area and make accessible all the potential that is available also at university level for all the students across the Alpine area, this is exactly what, what we are searching for. And uh, I, I can tell you on the chat, there is a remark that will uh, make you, uh, Anna, especially very happy <laughs> because I, I know that this is uh, exactly your thinking. Um, there's a person, I don't know who is it, uh, who is saying, I dream of a decentralized academy that lives all over different territories in Europe where the transfer of knowledge is at the core of the professional activities for local people. So finally, this is what you are doing with Edolo and with creating now the network of all of them. So uh, this goes exactly in that direction. Um, I'm afraid, as, as ever in all these conferences, uh, if you look at the clock, uh, our time has already gone. But nevertheless, I would like to ask you a, um, a very last question. And please try to be short. I know it is difficult in such discussions. But um, we have heard what everybody of you is doing, where are the priorities, where do you see the future, where do you see the problems and the potentials. We are here at USALP, you have your own activities. So from your point of view, how can we better work together, for instance, with the BCO in the future? Jan. Thank you, Thomas. So my answer is pretty easy. Um, I understand that the you are working on a outline of a digital strategy for the Alpine space, which I think is a fantastic endeavor. And I encourage you to go ahead. Please include or uh, reach out to the BCOs in uh, that space. I shared the map with you yesterday. I know that some of them you're already in touch with. The Slovenes are already talking to you. The Val d'Aosta is already so. But uh, in other areas, uh, please reach out to the BCOs and include them because it will be much more efficient because you are the end users, if I may say, you know what you need. You will make a plan in order to empower, to help the dynamism of your space. But the BCOs in a way, they're the ones with the political responsibility to actually allocate the policies, the public funds and plan the investments. So if you can incorporate them in your planning from the start, uh, and the, and we share the same objective. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's we're absolutely share the same objective. But if we can incorporate and align these strategies from the start, I think we have a much more better chance. Well, that was not very English, but we have a much better chance to uh, reach that very ambitious target of 2030. So please, that's my message. Let's work together. Please, let's cooperate. Let's also cooperate with the AG2, Ricardo. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, at the, at the subgroup, at the subgroup level, I represent my region uh, position at the, at the at subgroup level. I don't, um, I don't work at the edgy level, let's say, but uh, we are dealing with a with a bunch of activities and topics, not merely focused on the. Uh, digitalization processes of the manufacturing companies on digital industry, uh, 
uh, not only on uh, um, on that, but um, we can we can find uh, um, potential opportunities, spaces of collaboration, of course, uh, together with uh, AG5. Uh, as I was saying before, the subgroup um, is led by the autonomous province of uh, of Trento by Hub Innovazione Trentino, uh, bringing together uh, stakeholders from. Uh, other alpine regions from Austria, Italy, France, and so on, of course, coherently um, with the last uh, European Commission uh, uh, regulatory addresses in the last uh, uh, developments. Uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, a lot changes, um, and we focus. We are focusing our work more and more around topics uh, more related to the to the green and and the digital transformation so trying to make uh, our smes more uh, resilient more sustainable easing their uh, exchange of uh, circular economy best practices and so on so uh, this is uh, my my suggestion to get in touch with each other and maybe uh, to work on this kind of uh, this kind of topics at the at the, um, at the moment we are carrying out a couple of uh, uh, a couple of studies, a couple of uh, preparatory actions. The first one is uh, on how to is about on how to spread uh, um, the culture you, of circular yeah. economy in Alpine Ricardo, SMEs. Are, and yeah, yeah, we are sorry. well aware of these studies. Sorry, too long. Okay, <laughs> too, too long. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. I don't uh, like to no do problem. it, but we are aware of these studies. Yes, thank you. So uh, really, the, the potential for cooperation with Action Group Two is there, and uh, with Action Group One, I hope that we can also cooperate on uh, more intensively in the future. Maybe we should build a new project together. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, co cooperation and collaboration uh, is one of the key words of the EUSALP process, as you know very well. And so we have to apply it and collaborate uh, uh, in, in, in different uh, uh, ways, uh, sharing the experience we are doing within this uh, very complicated but very challenging process, which is the EUSALP process. And uh, so, and then the topic you are uh, dealing with is very, very important. Uh, it is a, an essential tool for the future of humanity, not only for the future of the Alpine region. So um, it's not, uh, it's impossible to think not collaborate with your action group. <laughs> Of course, we leave it. We leave it like that. That's perfect. <laughs> the, okay. The question is a, is a little bit different for Emilia because Emilia, you cooperated with us in the Smart Village project, so you are already part of the cooperation. So the question for you is not how we can cooperate, but maybe more uh, how can we go on with the topic of smart villages? What what should we do for the future in this uh, direction? Uh, thanks, Thomas. I was prepared to answer how we can cooperate. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I think that uh, I really like this European project because uh, it is all about networking and collaboration. It's about establishing these links because when you see that you have similar problems, you have similar ideas, then you start to work on them together, you share resources, uh, and most importantly, uh, you share information as well. So now when we have started collaborating with you, I was just uh, putting myself a note, uh, ask them how to join you, Salp. Uh, so once you know the people, you know that you're working together, uh, you, you have the same goal, then this is not a problem at all. So. Uh, I always say that when we have uh, when we have European projects, it's not only about the funding, but most importantly, it's about getting the right people there, the connecting, and then uh, in almost all of our projects, uh, we have a partnership uh, that we are working together for several years. And this is not uh, a fear that it wouldn't be the same in smart villages because now we're already looking for some uh, new opportunities and so on and so on. But it is because we have the same goal and that is rural development. So uh, when you are working uh, with such a sincere goal, uh, then 
I don't think there is a, a fear that we will uh, stop collaborating with each other. I, I don't fear this neither. And uh, I think you, uh, you draw my attention to a very interesting point uh, for the concluding remark also. Um, the, co the cooperation is also possible across the action groups because the action groups are not closed. So if uh, people also listening to us now today, they would like to join, for instance, our action group, action group five, they are welcome, they can address us. I see uh, Anna Georgi saying like this. So it is the same also for action group one, for action group two, etc. So these are the fields of cooperation because then we can really cooperate across the action groups by cross uh, being partners, but also integrating other people's, maybe also the, the BCO Jan could be uh, an interesting, at least observer with our action group so that we really can continue to cooperate. And I would, I'm really very much looking forward to this. I'm very afraid that uh, I have to stop now. Um, it was for me a very interesting uh, workshop. We have seen the, the input from the young people was very helpful. They bring an bring us their expectations and we all have to respond to their expectations not just to our ideas we have to build something from bottom up this was also raised in the chat several times uh, during these two days think from bottom up or if you talk about digitalization think from the end user and not from the technological side because else you make something completely wrong so um, this is for us very important. I, I think this was really much uh, underlined. But if we want to use the potentials, we also need digital infrastructures. This was really the point during this discussion also. If we do not have the digital infrastructure, we can stop our discussion. And for this, we need yeah. money. We need also business models that we can develop on it, because also there, we do not simply need to put some infrastructure somewhere we need first also to think, what do we want to make with it? And this is the smart village approach, by the way, that will, I will present in a, in a couple of minutes. And uh, this, the third point for me is really that we have to uh, use synergies. We really need to uh, talk together, uh, cross fruiting each other. I don't know if this is the correct English, but uh, really giving us inspiration from one to the other, because uh, when we do this, we create new ideas. We are much stronger together than each for each self alone. This is for me a little bit the conclusion. Thank you very much, Jan, Ricardo, Emilia and Anna for having been with us. Thank you very much. Good goodbye now. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Have a bye. nice day. Bye bye. Okay, so now let's let's switch the scenery. Sorry, uh, maybe I'm getting tired. I hope you can still stay. Let's say for the next 20 minutes, I will try to be um, as fast as possible. But we have still a very important moment now because we were. Uh, uh, one of our priorities in Action Group 5 really was this smart village approach. You have seen also how important it is for the Commission with the presentation by Silvia Michelini. And uh, one of our major activities now is really we want to go on with this smart village approach. We want to launch now the smart village network. And to give you a little inspiration, maybe into the theme of smart villages, we have prepared a short video that we can show to you now. With this small video, you have already seen a logo which was calling Smart Alps, and this is what we are going to discuss. I would uh, like to introduce to you now what we have done in uh, AG5, together also with other action groups, on the topic of uh, smart villages and how we are going to continue with this topic. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, 
next slide we can skip i will be a little bit faster next slide uh, smart villages was really one of the strategic initiatives of action group five and uh, we have not said it during these two days but uh, i say it now our motto our light motif of action group five is really we want to make the alps the forerunners of digitalization in europe with all that we have heard this morning, um, we know that it is very ambitious, but we try to be ambitious. And in the past, we have uh, developed several activities in this field. We have made an Alpine space program and integrated services. In Tessie, we have developed an Alpine space program project on smart villages, which came to an end. We have uh, developed, developed a study on fiber optics backbone, so what we were discussing just before. We have um, made a study on cross-border mobility, on smart SMEs, and we have a think tank going on on services of general interest. But you see, smart villages, smart T and red, is really one of the top priorities for us. Next slide. So um, we have developed in the period of 2018 and 2021, thanks to the support also to the Alpine Space Program, which uh, enabled us to have this project, uh, we have developed a common understanding and methodology of the smart villages approach for the Alpine area. We have proved that it works in practice also during the COVID-19 crisis. We have elaborated transferable tools with a digital exchange platform we have uh, formulated policy recommendations and we have laid the basis for further capitalization. And I think this project with Smart Village has really contributed to a great extent to the visibility of USAP. We've also seen it in the presentation of Christian Barre today. Next slide. Smart villages for us, as I said, also in the introduction, is not a model of uh, just introducing technology. On the contrary, it is about the use of technologies, the smart use of technologies. So it's really a more a model of rural development than anything else. And this is also what, un what was underlined today by Silvia Michelini. And this is our understanding. Next slide. So we have uh, tested it <clears throat> sorry, in practice in uh, different uh, pilot areas. We had, for instance, a very interesting case in Slovenia, Slovenia is always, always very interesting to cooperate because I would never have dared to go to speak to farmers about blockchain technology. But in Slovenia, the farmers said, we want to build something on block te blockchain technology. And they uh, created a project which is based on blockchain technology to assure the traceability of products, of farming products. So with a QR code, you can scan it then at the end at the market and you know uh, from which product, from which producer, from which farm this product comes from, who has transformed it, where it was stocked, etc. So a really smart solution for uh, something which interests all of us, I think. Next slide. We have also looked at uh, mobility. I think uh, all of you are familiar with uh, smart uh, solutions for mobility. So one of our partners, Pitstal in Tirol, for instance, discussed about uh, mobility and created a new platform for flexible transport system. Next slide. Or uh, in several villages in Switzerland, we tried to improve the uh, the communication between municipal authorities and the population with digital platforms like Crossiety or Megaphone. Fortunately, these platforms were introduced before March 2020, so really before the COVID-19 crisis. And all these municipalities who had already these platforms were very happy to have them during the crisis because it was much easier to discuss with the population during the crisis. Uh, next slide. And all these experiences, we brought them together on the digital exchange platform, which is free of use. You see the, the link below, you find all the examples that I presented now there. And this smart, uh, uh, this digital exchange platform contains also a smartness self assessment tool. So if you are a municipality, if you're a region, you can uh, try to assess your own smartness. 
it will give you some hints also with practical examples how you can improve your smartness. And this is really a transferable tool that is now available to all municipalities, all regions within, but also, of course, without, uh, outside of the Alpine area. Next slide. We also developed uh, some policy recommendations. I will not go into detail of them. We have already presented them also, for instance, to the European Commission. And you have heard that, uh, for instance, in the long-term vision for rural areas, there are a lot of elements already taken up. So we are quite happy that the Commission is, is really interested also in following all these activities. Next slide. Now, the, the really important thing, we were trying to build this experience with an Alpine space program project. And you know, the problem is always you make a program, a project after two or three year it ends and okay, it's finished. Now what happens? So uh, within USALP, it was recognized that smart villages is really a strategic approach, not only for action group five, but now also for the whole of USALP. So in 2020, all the nine action groups together decided we want to work for the period 2020 to 2022 on five strategic priority policy areas. And one of them is smart villages. Next slide. Um, the other ones, just to, to inform you, are spatial planning, where a user is trying to elaborate a common spatial development perspective for the Alpine area, because there isn't any for the moment from USALP. We want also to work all together on a carbon neutral, neutral Alpine region. Of course, this is a strong contribution to the European Green Deal and as well as an, on an innovation hub for green business, for instance, in wood and chan and timber value chains, sustainable tourism, green and digital industry. And we are also thinking about the use of innovation facility to support all these activities. So all nine action groups are working together on these topics. So for instance, also smart villages is one of them. Now on the next slide, we will see what, what we are doing in the strategic priority policy area. We have carried out a survey on existing smart villages in the Alpine area, because also as uh, Ms. Michelini said in her uh, presentation, smart villages is there. There are already many smart villages. So we tried to have a look how, who are they. We also tried to see what are the existing financial support mechanisms. Uh, we are actually promoting this smart village approach in the Alpine area because our ambition now as USALP is to transform as many as possible mountain villages and regions into smart villages. Still in this idea to be at the forefront or the forerunners of digitalization in Europe. And we want to create an exchange of experiences among these already existing or ongoing, under the way, being developed smart villages and smart regions. And this is why we are going to launch now the network of uh, Alpine smart villages and regions. You by, by the way, you find all the documents on the website of Action Group 5, which is indicated here. On the next slide now, um, we are actually now launching this network. So you see the logo on the right upper side, Smart Alps. This was the name that we tried to identify, the, the Alpine Smart Villages, the network of Alpine Smart Villages and Regions. We see it as an informal network, which aims to disseminate the Smart Villages approach and foster the Smart Village transformation in mountain rural areas across the Alpine Arc. We want to encourage the exchange of information and experiences across among the smart villages and smart regions already there in the Alpine area. And what seems important for me also is really, we want to transmit to the outside of the Alpine area, a modern image of mountain and rural areas, because sometimes we are identified like being a bit lagging behind, or I don't know. And this image for me is completely wrong. We want to show that we are really at the forefront of the development. And we want, of course, to foster contacts with similar networks and initiatives for mountain and rural areas all across Europe. And for this, it was also very helpful to have this discussion these two days. Now, on a very practical way, on the next slide, the foreseen activities of the network are regular meetings, of course, we want to have them, uh, hopefully also in physical 
presence. Uh, we want to exchange on good practices, initiatives and activities. We want to promote the digital exchange platform because this is a strong tool that is already there. We are thinking, but uh, we have to discuss about it, maybe to create even a label for Alpine smart villages and regions. But I know that there are already many, 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 many labels around. So this is something that has really to be discussed uh, very uh, deeply. We want, of course, to increase capacity building. We want to establish contact with experts and researchers because this is something very important for rural municipalities. They do not have the knowledge, the expertise, so they rely also on external support. And there we want to build the contacts. We want to foster the communication among the members and the network inside and outside of it. And as I said before, we want to advocate for the smart villages and smart regions approach also towards the outside and the general public. So this is the basic idea of the network. And on the next slide, as I already mentioned that uh, we want to build a loose network. We do not want to have another association, a foundation or whatever, because there are so many of them. Uh, we really want to cooperate. This is the focus of our activities. The network should live as long as municipalities and regions are interested to have this exchange. There will be a steering board with at least uh, one representative per country. Uh, we will have a presidency, of course. And uh, we from Action Group 5, uh, the two co-leaders, will manage this network, at least for as long as we have the support also by the Alpkov project. And um, we will um, now, I will um, then show you who is the actual members or the potential members. And to really formalize the network, we will have a first meeting with the potential members uh, in late June or September to discuss really with the members of the network that everything is fine for them and that we can really start with an activity program. On the next slide, you now see who are the first members who are interested in this network. And I'm really very happy that we can build on the experiences by the Alpine Space Program project because these were mainly partners already coming from this project. We have at the moment 12 regions or uh, and municipalities who are interested to join the network, which come from Germany, the Region Südlicher Oberrhein and Bodensee Standard Marketing GmbH. We have also the municipality of Sulzfeld, which is in uh, Baden-Württemberg. We have uh, two municipalities from Switzerland, Erden and Saas Fee, who are interested to join the network. We have a municipality of uh, Kungota in Slovenia and the BSC Crunch who are interested to join the network. And we have uh, five municipalities from uh, Liguria who are interested in joining the network, which is Campo Ligure, Cogorna, Corelia, Ligure, Mele and Orero. Uh, and I hope now, I hope really that there are many more who are interested to join this network. And if you are interested to join the network, you have seen the contact data on the previous slide. We will also send them to you once again. Please don't hesitate to contact us because we really want to exchange on experiences. We really want to have as many as possible smart villages and smart regions on board because we really believe in this smart transformation of our mountain areas. And we have here really a common potential that we can use. And how important it can be for uh, the municipalities. Therefore, we, we would like to show you one uh, testimonial from one of those uh, 12 municipalities which are listed here, which is the municipality of Ernen, where the mayor Francesco Walter will uh, tell us in his German language, but it is undertitled in English, why he is uh, working on the smart villages approach. So if we could have this uh, video now,
Smart Villages hat unsere ehemalige Gemeindepräsidentin kontaktiert und sie war eigentlich sofort begeistert von diesem Projekt. Sie hat es an den Gemeinderat eingebracht letztes Jahr. Also wir haben mal eine Bedürfnisabklärung gemacht, ob überhaupt ein Bedarf da ist bei den Einheimischen und bei den Feriengästen und das Echo war eigentlich sehr positiv und letztes Jahr im Herbst hat dann noch der alte Gemeinderat und jetzt auch im Januar der neue Gemeinderat entschieden, ja, wir machen dieses Projekt Coworking Space hier in Ernen. Wir werden dieses Coworking Space im alten Schulraum einrichten. Ab September können wir dieses Coworking Space dann dort einreichen. Wir müssen noch einen Verein gründen, auch um die Finanzierung sicherzustellen, aber die Gemeinde steht eigentlich voll hinter diesem Projekt. Also die Herausforderung ist wirklich die Finanzierung, weil wir haben ja die Lokalitäten, auch die ganze Reinigung und so, das, das ist eigentlich kein Problem. Für uns als kleine Gemeinde, wir sind ein bisschen mehr als 500 Einwohner, ist es natürlich eine rechte Investition, so ein Coworking Space einzurichten. Ich bin dann selber dann nach Zürich gegangen, dort gibt es verschiedene Coworking Space in Hotels oder bei, bei einer Bank. Ich wollte mal schauen, wie, wie die das machen. Und mir war eigentlich sehr rasch klar, dass 15, 20 oder auch 30 Arbeitsplätze oder Coworking Space Plätze für das besteht kein Bedarf hier in Erden. Was mir aber auch aufgefallen ist und was ich sehr gerne hier dann umsetzen möchte, ist, dass wir einen stimmigen Coworking Space äh, haben. Wenn die Leute dann sechs, sieben Stunden oder den ganzen Tag dort arbeiten, dass sie sich auch wohlfühlen und dass sie auch wieder kommen. Wir möchten eigentlich mit dem Coworking Space ein zusätzliches, zusätzliches Angebot zur Verfügung stellen, nicht unbedingt für die Einheimischen, aber zum Beispiel für die Jungen, die nicht mehr hier wohnen, zu den Eltern zurückkommen und zum Beispiel sagen, okay, ich komme jetzt schon am Mittwoch und ich gehe dann am Donnerstag und Freitag im Coworking Space und auch für die Feriengäste, die hier in Erden sind. Viele Wohnungen haben noch keinen Anschluss am Glas, Glasfaser und das können wir dann natürlich dann kompensieren. Es kommen rund 75 Musikerinnen und Musiker nach Ernen. Viele kommen auch mit ihren Partnerinnen und Partnern und die arbeiten teilweise auch. Und das war zum Beispiel immer ein Bedürfnis, gibt es eigentlich ein Coworking Space. Wir haben auch Konzertbesucherinnen und Besucher, die die pendeln teilweise. Die sind so begeistert von, von Ernen. Dann geht es ja morgen nach Bern arbeiten, kommen dann zurück. Und jetzt, wo Homeoffice angesagt ist, können sie natürlich auch hier in Ernen bleiben dann hier arbeiten und am Abend das Konzert besuchen und müssen dann nicht mehr, nicht mehr hin und her pennen. So, uh, thank you for this uh, short video. I think it was uh, very interesting to see and hear the mayor who is uh, now really very much convinced about this uh, idea of smart villages because he sees that there is a potential to change the way of life, the way of living and the way of working uh, through, for instance, this approach of co-working spaces in this uh, very concrete case. And this is one of the municipalities which is now very interested also in exchange with other municipalities to see what they are doing if uh, we can learn from each other. So this is the, the reason, the raison d'être, and why we launch now today this uh, smart village uh, this smart alps network the alpine network of smart villages and smart regions okay ladies and gentlemen uh, you know i am a swiss and uh, if a swiss is not on time he, that's a catastrophe it's uh, 12 o'clock uh, it's time for me to say you all the participants thank you very much for listening to us i hope that you can still sustain two or three minutes because i would like to thank at the end of these uh, two days all the speakers that were present today and yesterday with us we had very 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 much very very interesting inputs very inspiring inputs uh, we as action group five have uh, taken a lot of ideas what we can do in the future and the important thing was also to build connections with other uh, networks with other initiatives and i think that there is a huge potential we have seen it so thank you very much for participating bringing in your ideas your visions exchanging with us but i would also like to thank at this stage, once again, the team from Regione Val d'Aosta, who has uh, technically supported us. Without them, it would not have been possible to be here with you today. So thanks, many, many thanks really to Alessio and Pierre Simon, who were working very hard in the background. They are not visible for you, but they are the ones who are carrying all our work 
and without them it would not be possible. Thanks also for the Uffici Netsu who was uh, making available this platform. I hope it worked for everybody. For me it was very fine, it was interesting, it was a new experience and maybe it can be available also for others and we will certainly also use this tool for the next Digital Alps conference. So this was it from my side. Thank you very much and I would like to invite now Carlo to join me again and I leave the floor now to Carlo for really the concluding remarks. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, many thanks uh, also by my part to all the participants for their great contribution to these two days of work and uh, for all the technical uh, organization uh, to Valedosta staff. Uh, just a few final messages about the way ahead. Firstly, in the next month, AG5 will further develop the content discussed in the convention, so please don't hesitate to contact us, in particular to bring forward the initiative we explored in the workshop, so to finalize them for the USALP overall policymaker level. And I mentioned them. The Alpine roadmap of the future-proof digital infrastructure and platform with investment in Alpine cross-border fiber optics, Alpine X data places, and use Alp distributed micro digital innovation hub for rural areas, strictly tied with the smart villages approach. The Alpine roadmap about open data starting the path toward the common data vision and strategy, and uh, the model of digitalization that are effective in Alpine areas to ease the access to SGIs, especially in the e-health. The second message is, of course, about uh, the Smart Alps. <laughs> Today has been launched the Smart Alps, the network of uh, smart villages and regions for the Alpine area, so you already <laughs> heard this by Thomas. And the call is for municipalities and local communities to contact us to enter the, the Smart Alps network, starting now to take the full advantage of sharing the existing Smart Village experience because global digital markets, Green Deal, COVID-19 pandemic made a final call on digitalization to all of us. Final message, as AG5, we are already working on several very relevant cross-sectoral topics, as uh, you heard in the roundtable of today, and other topics can be developed together in the future. So, as Action Group 5 leaders, we welcome all of you that think that digital transformation is a key priority for the Alpine region to join us and become members of the AG5 to bring also new ideas and new topics uh, on the table. And uh, let me quickly thank also uh, the, the other AG5 members, in particular uh, Daria Kukovic and Paolo Perucci, for the work they have done uh, for the today convention and uh, for bringing up uh, key topics as uh, open data and digital connectivity infrastructure. And, uh, in the end, we hope uh, you really enjoyed these two days of uh, USALP works uh, organized by the AG5. And uh, thanking Mr. Callery for the kind invitation, <laughs> we will look forward to see all of, all of you next year. We do hope uh, in person in the beautiful Trieste, same period, for the second edition of the Digital Apps uh, Conference. See you next, next year.